The show is brought to you by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash falloutlorecast. Robots Radio presents the Fallout Lorecast. Welcome to the Fallout Lorecast, a place for the Fallout community to come together to explore the boundaries of our knowledge about the world of Fallout. All right, Fallout Wastelanders, Vault Dwellers, welcome back to the Fallout Lorecast. This is our final episode of the year, and we are back with our patrons for also the December patron episode. And that music you heard is the uh, the new intro. I've changed it up. It's getting a little bit more spooky, kind of serious this year with some of uh, the Brotherhood stuff coming to 76 and some of the other things going on. And I am here. I am your host, Tom or Robots, and I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Lainey. Lainey, welcome back to the show. How's it going? <laughs> Hello, hello, it's going pretty good. Uh, I moved today. Very exciting. I also and moved my body me. today. Ooh, is that what you talked about? You. Is that what you mean? Like you moved I, around? Well, I did a lot of that. Mm, mm. Yeah. But you actually We're moved. just going to skip over the part where a bed fell on my head. It's a, it's, no good. there's not really a story there though. So you know what? It's, I, it's my cat's fault actually. Oh, cat, the cat threw yeah. the bed at you? My, uh, well, so we were taking it apart, right? And then we had like pieces of it leaning against the wall and Noodle decided he was going to climb it. Um, we've hmm. been referring to it as matricide because he uh-huh. was trying to kill me, but it's, uh, it's, it's good. It's, yes, I like that. Again, I like right? that. Right? You can call right? it yeah. the, the day of the matricide. Um, yeah. well, I'm glad, I'm <laughs> glad it didn't actually kill you and that, uh, Noodle was only attempting to kill you and didn't actually succeed. Um, Make sure that you turn her into the authorities. And Noodle's the girl cat? Sushi's the girl cat. Sushi's the girl cat. Noodle's the boy cat. I get them mixed up because their names are both food. Um, But yeah, turn him into the authorities and, you know, make him pay for his crimes. Um, But anyway, we're back with all of our patrons. I'm going to go down the list alphabetically and say hi to each of you guys. Uh, Welcome back, Aperture Flash. How's it going? It's going good. The Canuck is out of the big truck for now. I'm... uh home for the holidays and i'm loving every minute of it how yeah. you doing tom good good i saw that fancy banjo you've got when, during the pre-show. oh my god i'm i'm so happy with it uh, it's the 1978 goya five string i could go on for an hour about it so i won't but it's beautiful you can do like banjo podcast i, I banjo could cast. I, I should yes i won't but you I should. should you could play it while driving down the road in your truck and podcasting <laughs> all at the same time i'm sure that's completely safe you know, I've done construction zones and banjos at the same time. I don't know about uh, the freeway. The state troopers <laughs> might have a word or two about that. Yeah, they'll see the head kind of sticking out the window. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, also, we have Deadshot returning. Deadshot, how are you doing? Howdy ho. Barely awake because it's 2 a.m., but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But you still made it, so welcome back. And then we have Fire Rider returning as well. Fire Rider, how are you? Trying to find my mute button. Hello! Hello. <clears throat> I'm doing good. I've had a heck of a December. Yes, yes. Firewriter had a very, very, very famous uh, person to all of us Fallout fans on her stream just, what was it, a week ago? It wasn't that long ago. Yeah, a week yesterday, a but week who's yesterday. counting? Yeah, yeah. And who was that? Tell us tell us a little bit about this. Well, that would be Danny Shirago, the voice of Hancock. Holy crap. I was very excited. Her favorite person <laughs> in the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't let me, my uh, husband hear you say that because he already has a complex. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, don't, tell him not to listen to the show and then we'll be good. Um, then we have returning Nunamur, Nunamur Vegas. Is this, you've updated your name again. All of us, a lot of us on the stream update our names a little bit just to, just to have fun. Welcome back. Thank you. Happy to be here as always. And uh, my big update is I want to talk about apps uh, Banjo. So I'm going to go, I'm actually going to talk an hour about apps banjo. So I think it's on subject, so I should be good, right? Yeah, I support this. Banjos are in Fallout 76, so technically it is some of the technology in Fallout. Well, maybe after the stream, I'll pull it out. Maybe after the episode's done, I'll pull it out and play a tune. We'll have like a, yeah, a little, a little, uh concert after the uh, recording um and then we also have nighttime smith who's new to the show welcome nighttime smith hello it's nice to finally meet you guys been listening to you guys for quite a while now 
Yeah, thanks for great to talk about this stuff. Thanks for joining us. I can see all the fun stuff uh, behind you in your room. Um, you've got thanks. you've got some of the the cool Fallout uh, banners and things on your wall. Yep, yep. Very, very, very cool. And then we also have Envy Courier who's joining us. Uh, this is your first time on the chat, right? Courier. Yeah, first time. Yeah, you're, you're such a staple time, of the community. I, like I, I see you in my streams and on the on the Discord all the time. That you know, after doing the, this for so long, I I'm, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, he's been on here before, right? I've known him for a long time now. Uh, but welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's like I've been hanging out with pretty much everybody on here. Yeah, yeah, you uh, you're very much a regular member of the community. It's really nice to have you on the show for the first time. And then we have Saber returning. Saber, welcome back. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I like your uh, little Pokemon guy there on the on the bottom. Thank you. <laughs> which uh, what's his name again? I forget which one that is. Uh, Gengar. Gengar. That's Gengar. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then uh, we also have the Mothman's Ranger, but your name is also changed a little bit this time. Welcome back. Uh, it's good to be back. You're, you're uh, Mothman's Mandalorian now. That's like the combination of these very interesting different worlds. Yes, it is. Uh, I was just, I'm an obsessive Star Wars fan, so I thought it was appropriate for the uh, coming of Mandalorian episodes, so. Yeah, that's that show has been awesome lately. Um, and then two, oh, two more people, we're, this has got a full house tonight. Uh, Vader1723 is joining us. Welcome, Vader. How's it going? Vader is looking for the mute button, maybe? Not sure. Still muted. Is- he said his mic was broken in the uh, chat. Uh, oh, sorry. Figured it out. There you are. Uh, Solved. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. And I'm excited to hear what you will be uh, coming up with this week uh, for our conversation. And then the final person we have is, of course, Victor. Victor's returning. Victor has spoken. Welcome. Yeah, because uh, I just barely started Mandalorian finally. Um <laughs> But yeah, I'm I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, welcome back. I'm, I, I, I'm like I'm kind of, I'm kind of to blame for the conversation tonight, I guess. No, but it's totally fine. Seems uh, trusted. Yeah, no, that's 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 a totally uh, the conversation. So speaking of the conversation tonight is about the technology in Fallout in the Fallout universe and how it differs from our own and how that may affect our lives or our thoughts on that. And to kick this off, uh, it, it seems that Nighttime Smith was volunteered to be our first to go. Nighttime, you ready to start? You want to jump in here? Sure. Uh, let's do this. Yeah, uh, I want to talk. I want to talk about the electric uh, cars, specifically in the Fallout universe, because I started playing Fallout 2. Um, I thought it was very interesting that you had uh, a transportation device that you could, you know, not have to deal with a lot of the random encounters in the game. Uh, that was nice. But it's one of the few games that allows you to do that in the whole Fallout universe, and I thought that'd be kind of cool to talk about. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, it's the only game with actual cars that you can drive around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is it? So I guess we were going to talk about how how it transitioned to normal life, or you know, in the in the past specifically. Um, I learned a little bit about uh, electric cars because the car in the game apparently has no onboard electronic devices, other than the conduits where it runs. It runs a completely analog mechanical system. So I had to look back to the 1890s and the 1920s for electric cars that of course didn't have circuit boards at that time because they, they weren't the integrated circuit wasn't invented yet, which is a staple of Fallout Universe. Um, apparently they were quite popular, especially in the city, because you didn't have to drive very far. Um, a lot of people had electricity in the city. And uh, by the time the oil oil came around after they discovered oil in Texas, everybody switched to gasoline powered cars because the technology was able to miniaturize enough and Almost every American family had a tractor or they had a pickup truck, especially if there there was farm life. It was just 100% necessary to the industrialization of agriculture. So that was kind of cool. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about the car itself. I think Aperture, we were talking about the Crisis Corporation, or how do you pronounce it? It's C-H-R-Y-S-L-U-S. Chrysalis. 
Chrysalis. Chrysalis. Yeah, it's like I've it's almost like Chrysalis. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's like a playoff of Chrysler, right? But it's different. Yeah, Chrysler and General Motors. Apparently, right. they they mix the two up. Um, what's interesting about that corporation is that they first developed commercial fusion power for vehicle systems, which is that's a huge jump in technology at the time. Um, let's see. Uh, there was the Corvega, which was a fusion-powered car, and then the Highwayman was an electric one that could just be apparently charged at home or using energy cells, especially in Fallout 2. I think most of the time I'd buy microfusion cells, and that would give me the most power. Um, it was an 800-plus horsepower engine, did 0 to 60 under a second, uh, had a fully analog system. Um, <laughs> 0 to 60 in not- under a second? That's amazing. Yeah, like it- I don't like think I've ever. I haven't read that stat about that before. That is that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, it's like I mean, how many G's is that when you're I mean, just like what kind of tires oh, do you four. need for that kind of thing? Like, <laughs> holy crap! Uh, apparently, they were going for about a little under two hundred thousand uh, dollars. I figured in what that would be to us for inflation. That's around forty two thousand. Okay. Um, maybe people just didn't make that much money in that time. Um, in the post-war tech, uh, the ones that were around were really reliable. Uh, obviously, if they didn't have they didn't have any circuit boards or systems like that that were very fragile, um, they would have been immune to any nuclear blasts. Uh, the EMPs, I should say, not the actual thermal blast. But mm-hmm. um, you could put a lot of stuff in the trunk. I think I've seen people. Apparently, there's room for a death claw, a super mutant, and a few other companions in the game. <laughs> right. Um, and that's about it. Apparently, cars weren't that available at the, what was it, um, in 2061 to 20, 2240. Um, but just finding spare parts. Apparently, fuel wasn't that much of an, uh, that much of an issue because the Brotherhood of Steel, they would usually make uh, a lot of uh, energy cells for weapons and systems like that. Tires, glass, you know, small components like that were hard to find. Mm-hmm. And that was the hardest thing for keeping vehicles like that on the road. Apparently they were popular enough, if you went to New Reno, somebody would steal your car and they'd run it through the chop shop. And then you had to try to get it back. <laughs> right. So that's, that's basically a lot of the, the stuff I found out about the cars. Yeah, that's, And they're kind of interesting. That is interesting. Now, how would you feel about having vehicles like that in the real world? Um, to be able to afford something with the power of a Tesla Roadster, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's a very, very fast, high-tech car. But the fact that you don't have any sensitive electronic systems that you that could get damaged from water or um just everyday use i mean that makes the survivability of a vehicle like that very interesting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah does anybody else have any thoughts on this stuff this is a i mean this would be a wide ranging technical divergence from our own technology especially if you were living in pre-world fallout universe you know who wants to jump in um Victor? I, I actually wanted to, to touch on, um, I, I'm glad you specifically talked about the EMP blast of the nuclear bomb, because that's uh, what knocked out so much of the pre-war tech that is left rotting in America, to be quite honest. it's They don't have the ability to, to fix it after the EMP wave. Um, so uh, you're saying that in this car, then the electronics would be even more robust than, say... A common card is a '90s. Um, yeah. they, that, that those electronic devices, and I'm not even talking about like you know even to the 2010s, but like '90s and aughts, that still had some electronic components to your cars that can mean you have to go to the mechanic, so to speak. Yeah, what's interesting about this, it seems to copy a lot of technology from the turn of the century. So there's not a lot of small, hard to manufacture electronics. And that's what's mostly affected during an EMP. It's because when it's it's an electromagnetic wave that energizes small copper circuits, and it puts mm. so much energy through those small circuits they blow. So the only way to repair that stuff is to just manufacture new new chipsets. Well, this type of vehicle doesn't have any chipsets. So it, then, just to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, then, so the electricity is being di- essentially directly transformed into mechanical energy and not much else going into any kind of particular systems for the car. Yeah, it's just, they're all mechanical switches. So it goes from uh, on-off switch to different levels of power that runs through the, the motor. There's mm-hmm. no advanced controller system. It's just 
it's a stepper. So it goes from 12 to like 24 to 36 to 48 to give it more and more power. And that's that's apparently how early electric cars work. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just wasn't aware that that was the direction that the electric car had gone in Fallout. So I, I was really glad when you mentioned that specific part of it, because that always has me interested about like, the electronics in Fallout is post-EMP waves. Yeah. Especially for consumer electronics, like you were wanting to talk. Like, I can't imagine how... Um, yes, but that will be late, later. But yeah, there's a lot of it that I'm surprised it survived, but I think I have good ideas as to why the particular things did survive. So do any, any, anybody else have any thoughts about this? Like, how would you feel dri- riding in a vehicle that, that that's this different than what we currently have? Do you think this is a better option, or is this just more dangerous? Or <sighs> what do you think? Numer? I I was I unmuted when I had something I thought you were going in a different direction so this is kind of That's unrelated fine. That's but fine. Go ahead. Uh, okay um so just talking about the survivability of the tech and how that's potentially possible and all that uh the funny thing is if you do any research into um what would happen without a government infra- infrastructure keeping the roads paved keeping the roads repaired it's something like within like 10 years all roads would be undrivable so it's kind of funny that the rational the rationale to keep you know this tech working into the post apocalypse you know makes some technological sense but the fact that we have drivable roads unless there was some different way that they were paving roads, perhaps using some sort of different mixture that we don't know. Because the roads in most Fallout games, you know, you, you come across a little section where maybe it's broken apart and you have to take a detour. But um, it is it is very cool. Like, I, I have fond memories back in Fallout 2 of getting a car because I'm a big car person. I'm not super into all the tech 100%, but I love cars. And so getting a car in Fallout was great, even if I'm the back of my mind, I'm saying like, the car is working, <laughs> <laughs> the roads wouldn't be. Yeah, that's no. that's kind of the opposite problem that I have with, uh, I guess, I, I wouldn't say problem, but just issue I have with sometimes the Fallout games. The idea that like even 200 years after the bombs drop, people have had plenty of time to rebuild things, but they're still only building things out of old crap. You know, like, like... I- wouldn't we be making bricks again? Wouldn't we be making like, you know, some not, things new? Not, nece- not necessarily because the base uh the base technology to make something as basic as a brick. The, the technology has evolved so far from the most basic version of that and then gets cut off with no path backwards to an older analog system. It is much harder because people know how that it was created. But they don't know how they would have been created without the tools or, they had. Of sure, them. sure, yeah. and and I, I think that does apply for a lot of things. But what about what about just wooden structures or uh, structures made out of stone? You know, like wouldn't we go yeah. back to say like a medieval type of infrastructure where we can just build things out of simple materials that we can just gather from nature? You know, there, I feel like the world would probably start looking more like that with the occasional old stuff tacked in when needed as opposed to just everything's built out of garbage, you know, but it does create a certain aesthetic for the world. So I was going to say, it also comes down to like, um, priority and kind of the hierarchy of needs, Hmm. you know? And, um, do you really have the luxury of sitting and trying to figure all this stuff out when you're constantly under attack, which uh, from animals or from humans, you just may never have the chance, Uh, you know, you got to have that, that certain, certain base level of comfort before you can really start yeah. building on it. Yeah, that's a solid point. Interesting. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the Nuka Break made down, a yeah. uh, pretty solid point on that one there, Fire, whereas people have time to learn how to draw. Like, who has time to learn how to draw in the wasteland? If you got time to learn how to draw well enough to make a wanted poster, probably have well en- time enough to figure out how to, you know, make a mud brick, I would say. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think it just depends on your specific circumstances. But yeah, I, I think in general, you can say that people would have less free time to just, you know, invest in those I kinds think of it pursuits. Also, I think it also comes down to, like, uh, availability. Like, if you look around Fallout in more so forward than 76, kind of error trees aren't that, like, they're there, but they're not everywhere. Whereas wood, like the metal from scrap cars and all that is, so it's more 
easier to find metal than it is wood. Yeah. So it'd be more convenient yeah. of grab this, throw it together fast. You have a shelter. Right. Instead that makes of, sense. Oh, chop wood and all that. Well, Victor, so go ahead and close this up because I, I definitely railroaded us away from the main topic. So I'd like to pull us back yeah. at some point, but go ahead and finish it out for us. It, it, it does actually pull together the kind of tangent back to transportation, which is great. The reason I would think that the reason why both um, so much of the roads have survived all the way to 20, 2277, and also that. Um, we don't see as much possibly evolution of technology, so to speak, where the wasteland got knocked to the Stone Age, so to speak, and then brought back up. It's because who survived? What portion of the community survived and didn't get radiation sickness? Or then they became a ghoul but didn't go feral? Who had that, that knowledge? You're talking about carpentry and stonemasonry. That's a specialized trade, even now and in, now in here, we're talking about plumbing or anything like that. Would those people have survived, and would they have been able to survive, know how to backtrack from their own technology to an older technology, and then train the next generation? Mm-hmm. And then with roads, that's again, there's just fewer people on the roads. Right. You know, a road that right. takes hundreds of cars an hour is not going to break down as quickly as it would if it's just, you know, four cars a year. Yeah, yeah. It, it would point. just real quick. It would actually break down without cars. The, because the of study, nature, um, because of because yeah, of weather. Just the exactly. Right. Yeah, it, it's um the the calculations done to figure out like how long infrastructure would stay in, in place would be if in a like a snap in an instant there was no humans, no ah. no uh, anything, no cars on the road. The car the roads would just bridges would collapse within like five years, I think, and then the roads would be undrivable in ten years. Okay. Well, wow. that I wasn't quite aware of that, but it still does bring together that idea of who survived with the knowledge to do these mm-hmm, things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to pass it, it on. Cars, right. Or do masonry, et cetera. Right, especially in a world where so many of us are uh, educated in things other than actual things that would help us survive <laughs> and rebuild. Like we have degrees and things that wouldn't even be applicable in the apocalypse. Well, nighttime, thank you for bringing this topic up because it definitely shot all of us into a direction where we've been really now thinking about this stuff and, and you know, tangents for it. Um, do you have anything else you want to say before we move on? Um, I think that was about it. Um, yeah, I tried to shorten this down as much as I could just so I could get it straight to the point. Yeah, I, think I, I'm all good. Thank I appreciate you. it. And feel free to jump in as we talk about some other things. Um, Aperture Flash wanted to continue some of the discussion around transportation. Aperture, what, do you, what are you talking about? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was actually looking at the design of uh, transportation in uh, the, the Fallout universe. Uh, the, the Chrysler's Highwayman is a bit of an outlier in that it's got a slightly raised suspension and it's not just a, a like a ground crawler uh-huh. y- you look at all the cars in the the pre-war segment of fallout 4 fallout 3 you know any game with the cars in them and the trucks and the buses you notice how they've got that that 50s like low to the ground the bumper will scrape the pavement if you hit a speed bump kind of feel uh-huh. um so i was looking into that and i was thinking about it these vehicles are designed purely for comfort. There's next to no practicality in the actual physical design of these vehicles. Um, those low to the ground, wide tires, you know, there's probably a lot of suspension hidden under there. That is to give you a smooth ride on smooth kept pavement. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, what you were talking about earlier, how they may have a different. Uh, like formula for the pavement or the concrete or whatever the, whatever the road is made of, it makes sense because to have vehicles like this on mass, you'd have to have a really well taken care of uh, infrastructure system. Like I was looking at, uh, sorry to bring it back to my one track mind, but I was looking at the semi trucks in in uh, Fallout seventy six the other night. Mm-hmm. You know, they're all cab over engine designs. Uh, we call that design a bullnose, where the, the there's a short hood and a, the engine goes under the driver. There's not much room for the driver, so it's more about making the drive smooth rather than, you know, personal comfort. everything else. Yeah, yeah. personal comfort. Right. So right. the uh, it, it's all victims of a design by committee. What do we think will look good? What do we think will 
will work well in a way that um, people will buy it who don't necessarily know what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and like going back to the analog versus digital cars, we still have analog cars on the road. Uh, a lot of supercars are still analog. Um, unless you've got that paddle shift, that, that's a whole different topic, but unless you've got that paddle shifting system, a lot of supercars are still analog. A lot of, um, up until the 80s, cars only became digital in about, you know, 83 when uh, GM and Ford started introducing that. So the the divide isn't that far when it comes to um, vehicle technology. Uh, as far as the engines go and the transmission and uh, like the onboard diagnostics, that's that was the original reason why we went digital. It's just so that we could a make more money off bringing it into the shop mm-hmm. and b know what was wrong easier. Uh, so vehicles in the Fallout universe, <laughs> other than the Highwaymen, they're not really designed to survive anything except for smooth dry clean pavement <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah so, so good luck on that road <laughs> yeah I, I don't yeah there aren't many models of different kinds of cars we've seen in the games there's there's a few different models but none of them particularly look like off-road type vehicles even the I had, a, I had an idea about that do you think that because those cars were modeled as uh, luxury vehicles mm, yeah well everyone wanted luxury back then so that makes perfect sense because yeah. a lot of this stuff is really expensive, looking at even with the rates of inflation. I would think that if they were designed that way, they were designed that way because only really rich people could afford them. Mm-hmm. Like in... My apologies. I was going to say that that totally fits in as the uh, pre-war, just before the drop, bombs dropped aesthetic that they were at least trying to promote within America itself, whether or not this is reality all over the country, is that... Po- post World War II, literal boom era of employment and children, and white picket fence, two cars, two point five kids, level of luxury that you'd see on, I'd say, Leave It to Beaver. So mm-hmm. p- promoting all of these things as luxury items makes them wantable. There, it's a society that is just prime for the picking to be like, oh, but this is the luxury model. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, in a world where everyone has, you know, a robot butler and uh, automated kitchens and, you know, the house right. cleans itself, why wouldn't you want a luxury, low and slow vehicle? Yeah. Well, I think a- it's also, oh, I was going to say, it's important to note, too, that not everybody had those things. Um, this was a world where those things were, there, there's a big, just like today, there's a really big income gap. So those are the signs that you kind of have made it and you're in that higher income gap and you're not scrambling to survive like a lot of people would be at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's That's specifically why I stated that that is the image that America is promoting whether right. or not that's the image of America. Right. Uh, yeah. Keep in mind, a lot of what you see in Fallout is, post, is pre-war propaganda, which is, I mean, Liberty Prime t- times a million. The capitalism will always be communism because capitalism gives you... Leave it to Beaver with an atomic car. Yeah, when your city bus looks like a Cadillac, it, it's going to put out a good image, but as soon as winter hits, it's going to be absolutely absolutely useless to you. you got to... <laughs> you know, you it's going to yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you check out the uh, Red Rocket uh, terminal in Fallout 4, the me- the mechanic is actually complaining about, you know, how the cars are constantly breaking down and they're next to impossible for a small guy to fix and ha- he ends this terminal entry by saying, well, they don't build them like they used to because apparently that that bubble car was about the only uh consumer grade vehicle that you could get around that time. Yeah, the bubble car. <laughs> Those little, those little domes. Is that that same old driver one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Any other thoughts on this? Anybody? I think we're good. Aperture's giving the thumbs up. Who would like to go next? Does anybody have something that kind of plays off of this vehicle technology thing we've been talking about? Or anything? Or should I just pick somebody at random? 
we're just getting lots of lots of smiles lots of just looking at the camera all right well we'll go down we'll go down the list uh i know deadshot deadshot you wanted to kind of go into something that was going to go right into victor and victor wants to go last right so maybe we'll go to fire fire you want to you want to go next yeah just one sec um I did uh, download some notes here on my device. On your pit boy. <laughs> she pulls out yeah, the pit so boy. We're talking about uh, the pit boy. Uh, so the <laughs> Fallout's answer to the smartphone. <laughs> right. That's not very smart at all. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was interesting because there's there's a lot of questions that I have about the pit boy and kind of how it works. But my research did not give me a lot of answers. <laughs> so I think a lot of these things are just a, kind of a function of the gameplay. And we might have to use our imaginations to fill in the rest of it, which I'm, I'm up for the task. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, there's a whole bunch of different variations of Pip-Boy. And it's a lot of the times you have to kind of come up with a way to... Mm, manipulate the gameplay mechanics to try to make them fit in to give them a a plausible explanation and this is kind of one of those things where the as the games progress the technology of the pit boy progressed as well but since all of it happened at the same time how do you explain that right Uh, (laughs) but so um i think the first the first version of the pit boy that we see we actually don't really see it until later and it's kind of the prototype but you see it in the opening sequence in fallout 4 you see the guy wearing you know it doesn't look like this it's like a little tiny screen and then gigantic not i don't know how to say not encased machinery all about it that Mm. clearly is not practical in any sense of the right of, right uh, <laughs> because, because the pit boy is to jump in real quick the pit boy is kind mm-hmm. of an anomaly when it comes to technology because mm-hmm. miniaturization of of electronics hasn't happened so to have something right. even the size of a regular pit boy that we're used to in say yeah. the more recent games is still a little bit odd in the world yeah for sure and yeah. but i mean you can see you can really see the difference between you know what we th- what we know as you know a smartphone versus you know, we've still got the uh, cathode ray tube sort of screen. Um, you know, you can see, I'm trying to hold this up, this is such a nice replica. You can see the wires mm-hmm. where they all connect. Um, everything is external. Uh, there's like, this is probably like for a fan to like cool it down, yeah. you know, and I bet this would get really warm to wear. But like one of the other questions that I had that I couldn't get a solid answer to was kind of, it does all these things to track you know, your well-being. Right. There's no clear answer on how it does that. Does it, does it have a sensor? Does it, like, does it, like, plug into you somehow? Right, is <laughs> it somehow, like, tapped closer? into your arm through some yeah, sort of, like, yeah. uh... and I could not get a satisfactory <laughs> answer onto that. And I'd actually had a conversation with a friend about it before, and she was convinced that it basically, once you put it on, it, like, trunk into your arm and got all that information from you. But that didn't make sense either to me, so I don't know. Anyway, you would, you would think, if that was the case, you would think that characters, when you, when you first put it on, there's so so many of the games you find the Pip Boy early on and you put it on, mm-hmm. right? You you'd have yeah. like a oh, that oh hurt. yeah, that's yeah. that's what I thought too. Oh you know, god, I can't ever take this that. off. <laughs> you know, like some sort of reaction to it. Yeah, but I mean, you obviously can because you can change clothes and stuff like that. You wouldn't be able to get clothes on over and. But uh, sure. anyway, the, I think the other thing that's really funny about it is this thing's really heavy. You know, and I think the real one would be even heavier. I can't imagine trying to, you know, attack things with this. Or, I mean, this isn't my dominant hand, so I wouldn't be trying to aim a gun with it. But anything I'd you be trying be to do. You might be stabilizing a gun with it. Say a rifle. Yeah. You'd, you'd be holding it up with your yeah with your other hand. I'm going to have to mess with that one time when I'm in VR to try to see if I can get yeah. a real feel for that. Or everybody just um, has really, really big left shoulders. I know. <laughs> really strong left shoulders. <laughs> It's from when I used to play the flute and like this yeah. arm always sat a little higher than the other one. They thought, you know, you got something wrong with your back, but it's just because you play the flute and your arms up like that. Yep. Um, yep. Anyway, um, kind of moving along. Um, so this is this is the Pip-Boy 2000 Mark IV, or excuse me, Mark VI. Uh, this is the one you see in 76, and it's an offshoot, actually, of the ones that you see in... Um, fallout and fallout one and fallout two um i didn't play fallout one fallout two but uh obviously i've played 76 and um so uh the main difference 
according to the wiki is uh, the way the map is portrayed. And again, that's a function of gameplay technology mm-hmm. uh, improving. But, you know, uh, it's it's hard to kind of work out why this was such a massive leap when it's still the same model, essentially. Right, right. And then um, in the Pip-Boy 3000 is what you see in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. And uh, that's also... Uh, pretty similar to the 2000 but it uh has additional features like a radio a geiger counter and the light and then uh there's also and i've never had the fortune of encountering this but i'm gonna have to try to find a way to encounter it uh the pimp boy three billion pimp boy Uh, (laughs) the pimp boy three billion that you can get in fallout new vegas Uh and apparently it's a reward that you can get from mick and ralph's if you're able to persuade the Omertas to return to Mick <laughs> for their weapons needs, and then uh, Mick will give you the Pimp Boy 3 billion, which is like gold plated. And, mm. and apparently, if you have the Wild Wasteland trait, it'll uh, play dis- disco music every time you equip it, which is hysterical. And that's, I'm going to have to. That's amazing. <laughs> I have not encountered this, but. Uh, oh, here but, we go. Uh, I'm going to yeah. put an image of it up on the screen because this thing's awesome. <laughs> you found it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just found it. Um, I was delighted to discover the Pimp Boy 3 billion. <laughs> Pimp Boy 3 billion. Cool stuff. All right, here it is on the screen right now. There it is. Gold plated. Pimp Boy 3, three billion. It's Where a, is it? It's on the, the, it. the stream. Uh, you'll see it on the screen. Um, screen. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I see it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, gold plated. Very fancy. Very fancy. <laughs> That's awesome. Can you imagine? Yeah. So, so but the, yeah. So, there's one more, and that's the Mark IV, mm-hmm. and that's uh, this one. The three thousand uh, Mark IV. IV. This is the three thousand Mark IV. Right. Uh, so again, different enhancements. You, the control dials got moved, and uh, they were using before what they called a biometric lock, and I don't have a, I don't know what quite what they mean by that. Uh, But on this one, it's just... Because, like, on this one, you can see where it's got a cuff. um, It's worn like this. Mm -hmm. This one is just... Just like in the game, it just slaps on with a latch. Yeah, latches. Yeah. So, very different there. And that also, you know, begs the question of, again, how how do you... How does it read your stuff? Did you you find anything (laughs) on the justification of, say, um, people in different vaults had scientists that tweaked the designs? Or I did not find anything anything about that. I I I find that it's it's really curious that it seems to be kind of a regional thing. Um, Like they said, you know, Mark IV is distributed near Boston, but then why were the... Why was the 3000 delivered in two areas completely across the country you know las vegas versus uh right. Right. dc there's just there's there's no real clear justifications on any of that um yeah it just comes down to eh, we made another game and we had to make some changes mm-hmm. to the pit boy so now there's another version of it i mean like yeah sometimes so you, people you look really for lore answers yeah some, <laughs> some people want lore answers for things that don't really have lore explanations mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah that's just kind of the way it goes so Okay, so what are your thoughts on actually using one? I mean, you talked about it being a little bit unwieldy to have to use. If you were if you were in the wasteland and you came across a pit boy, or you were somebody who left a vault, would you take your pit boy with you? Would you find it a useful tool? I think so. Yes, and that mainly comes down to the fact that it does have satellite tracking in it, so it it basically uses GPS technology. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we all know that we can look on our maps and see where we're at, and you know, see what we've discovered, and that's that's in the pit boy it's meant to be in the pit boy so yeah i mean i i would use it the same way i use my phone I, i'd want it on me you can get messages on it uh you can play video games on it yeah, yeah. <laughs> why wouldn't you want one yeah. <laughs> so i mean it, i think i think you'd be used to it you wouldn't have any basis of comparison to me it feels very unwieldy and awkward compared but if you have if if this never existed think of what these looked like in 1994. Yeah. You know? Right. So, um, with, with no basis of comparison, I, th- I think that the, uh, the usefulness of it would, um, make me want to have one despite, um, the drawbacks. 
Yeah. I got you. Although I think twice about it if it did in fact like latch into my into your body or was or was like arm. three times as heavy as the replica one you have. Yeah, and it's hard to yeah. say, you know. I mean, I don't know how. I mean, this feels very unwieldy. It's awkward for sure. Yeah. What did the rest of you guys think? Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, can I say something real quick? Sure. I was thinking about, you know how nasty your arm is after you have a cast on it for a long time? Uh Uh-huh. Not only would you be tearing it out of your arm, but just imagine the skin around it. That's not pleasant. (laughs) I've cosplayed a couple times with this one, and let me tell you how much my arm hurts by the end of the day, because it, like, will slide down slightly and, like, press... Into ah, this part of your, your hand, wrist, yeah. it hurts. It really hurts. So yeah, it would. You'd, you'd feel pretty funky. But it, it would also get stinky <laughs> with all the sweat, and and mm-hmm. yeah, and I think that's what uh, you're talking about, Lainey. Is that it, it would just at some point you would just feel gross and smelly with that mm-hmm. on your arm all the time. Yeah. So I I have some thoughts on the Pip Boy. <laughs> if I can jump in, yeah, go for it. Uh, I've been thinking about the Pip Boy since 1997. I have thoughts because uh, it is it, it it's the thing. It's the one. It's one of the major things that breaks floor. It's a lore nightmare because of mm-hmm. so many things about it. Um, the micro technology, you know, so, so many things. Um, but I know ways off headcanon like rationalize different things. And one of the biggest questions with the Pip Boy is vats, and it's overthinking a game mechanic it really you know it's like are we freezing time are we slowing down time you know how does how does it work and i think that fallout 76 kind of saved us there because i think what the way that vats works in fallout 76 makes a lot of sense in real life it's it's assisting you targeting it's not slowing down time it's not changing time whatever now of course in order to do that it would need to be plugged in to your nervous system i guess and in order to work i don't even know how that would work but um the way i've always rationalized the previous games as far as like slowing down or stopping time is Uh that essentially it falls into the your character special and it's giving you sort of what it like their reaction time their reaction time is going to be better than everybody else because for whatever reason you're the chosen one you're the vault dweller you're this special person so you're like a superhero sort of and it's giving you that power fantasy by giving you vats and again i think it thematically makes a lot of sense that vats works the way it does in 76 where we're just regular people we're in, we're all individually as a mm-hmm. group mm-hmm. the the hero you know right, right. so we don't get that slow down of time we just get the targeting you know and then as far as like the the um bio medical aspect of it even if it doesn't plug into your system even if it doesn't go into your skin or whatever th- think about some of the technology we have possible today which a lot of that is uh due to micro technology being a possibility but things like finger stick um oxygen blood oxygen tests or um you know a a home cuff for your blood pressure and when i look at a pit boy i think of a blood pressure cuff Mm. and so my my head canon is that it's testing various factors and sort of giving you a a basic understanding of your medical condition so it's checking your heart rate it's checking your blood pressure it's uh, checking your blood oxygen levels it's check, checking all these different things and then giving you a visual approximation of your damage or your current state. whatever but yeah, your current physical again state. it has it, but again vats makes it only make sense if it plugs somehow into your nervous right. system so or or if it's just giving you a, a percentage chance on say you know a shot you know like what if it's recording you know it knows that you are you tend to be this good of a shot with a pistol because it seems like you hit this many times it seems like you don't this many times and somehow it's tracking that information in order for you like in a moment's notice to look at it and then pick the head of the person that you, you're looking at you know like yeah, like obviously the 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 way it would be displayed would be different, but like super mutant, four hundred yards. Like the thing is detected. Super mutant at four hundred yards. I have a sniper rifle in my hand. It's giving me a seventeen percent chance to hit it in the head based on my past history of shooting things at their heads. You know, I, I don't know, but you could you could say that it's some sort of like data collection processing unit. All all hey, pretty is very good. For four hundred yards, four hundred <laughs> yards. That's pretty far. I'll praise the almighty uh, algorithm, I guess, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, it's just another way to conceive of it. I have kind of two ways of speaking on this because 
the Pip Boy isn't the only Pip system that we know of in Fallout. It's the only one that we use. But there is a because there are notes that you can find. I can't remember which Fallout it is. But there was a periodic development for a thing called a Pip Pad, which was supposed to be a holdable Pip Boy. So instead of it being on your wrist, it was like a computer screen you took out. And it was supposed to be like a cheaper alternative because having something bulky on your hand, on your arm, what do you think? Um, and I feel like personally, the way I'd look at bats and whatnot is it runs a simulation based on like your shots taken. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of like what I was saying. Tough an enemy scanned in and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then would approximate that based on the attributes you put in. So it would run diagnostics on you by putting in, like, this is your height, this is the weapon you're using, what condition the weapon is in, run a thousand simulations and go, this is your outcome of success on doing that out of such amount of simulations. And then bringing it into game would be like that. And I feel like, especially in 4, where the biometric data I actually looked into that at one point in four because I got really excited about biometrics because that's one of the things that I have a special interest in. Um, The biometric locking data in four essentially means that your pit boy is yours. Unless it is white, which is what the one in the front of the vault is. It was white when it was going out. It means it's locked to your biometric data, your precise DNA string and your precise DNA set. Hmm. So it can't be used by someone else who can just go and take it off you. Which I feel that's why, personally, I'd look at it. That's why I can read, like, your arm is broken because it reads your blood pressure, your all that, through biometric systems and then runs um, simulations. We get like, it. The pit pad can do something similar. We, we get an example of that in uh, Fallout New Vegas, uh, Honest Hearts. There's that uh, fella Eddie at the beginning of the, of the uh, DLC who uh who raided one of the local vaults and his pit boy is actually you can do a technology check and say your biomed lo- screen is locked um that's not your pit boy and he you know he tries to talk his way out of that mm. um uh, like that's why i believe that it will actually jab you in the arm when you put it on like i i fully believe that it has um, to take some of your dna in order to to process it's also worth noting that um, the Pip Boy 2000 is actually better suited for to be worn on the uh, the the uh, right arm rather than the left arm that you normally would. It's it's better suited for a, a left-handed person um, just because of the way that the knobs and all that are positioned in the original Fallout 3 and you know all that. You actually have to reach across your screen to adjust all the knobs, the radio, the Geiger counter, all that, uh, hmm. and when they switched to Fallout 4, whichever model that was, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, they actually moved all those knobs and dials and controls to the other side of the uh, the Pip-Boy. Yes. Interesting. Lainey, you had something? Yeah, so if it's the case that possibly it's a a one-person, one Pip-Boy type deal, um, is there a way for it to reset? Because in Fallout 4, for example, you take it off of a dead body. No, I would, yeah, no. it reboots. I, I would when, okay. you, when you know when you take it off, and when you first put it on, you see the reboot screen. So mm-hmm. maybe oh, okay, just okay. by sitting there long enough or not being used, it must have reset. Because or maybe when the host dies, like, maybe it knows could, when the host yeah, dies, yeah. and it goes, "Okay, erase data." That would make sense. And then somebody oh, else yeah. puts it on; it automatically reboots and resets. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. when it when you load it up, there's a whole screen of text. And at some point or another, I took a screen cap of that or a third. And I know it does mention specifically reboot when, when you... Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It would definitely know if you died. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it resets when you died, though, because uh, that fella in the Honest Arts DLC, he stole it off a dead body and it was, it was locked out. I think um, it had either sat long enough in Fallout 4 or the scientist knew he was going to die, so he just wiped his clean and did a factory reset. A- there was a mm. fan theory that I seen that um, I kind of actually like it. Uh, the scientist didn't actually, that wasn't his pit boy His pit boy got stolen and he tried to put it on before he was shot. So his biometric data couldn't be thing. So it was a fresh pit boy and he was trying to open the vault door. 
that's the theory that I kind of seen that could make sense. Does best I, because the reboot screen, personally, like I see where you're coming from, Nimmer, but the reboot screen really wouldn't make sense if it was reading biometric data because it would save back to a data RAM stream on an outskirt layout to keep in a server store in case the Pip Boy died or got damaged so you could reboot it and keep it. Yeah, Saber? Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, so. It, when, while we're talking about dead people with Pip Boys, we could mention the one in uh, uh, that they took off the clone in uh, in Fall I was, Three. I was actually going to mention that um, in the whole whether or not it would actually penetrate the skin. Because, Gary, um, Gary. yeah, Gary, poor <laughs> Gary, poor <laughs> Gary, um, is I I agree that for a lot of the higher tech and kind of abilities that the pit boy has in regards to checking your well-being keep an, uh, w- another thing that um as far as i remember the pit boy che- keeps track of is what drugs you've taken and then what your effects are once you're coming down off your chems mm-hmm. is i imagine that they would be able to create this is definitely going way off into fan theory but in the medical field, my, I know about this specifically because my mother, they create ports so that rather than having to pierce your vein every time they have to do chemotherapy, they have an easy access right about right on your skin. Well, if they need to access your bloodstream and your nervous system, just put a port on your arm and have the pit boy hook into the port. Mm-hmm. And then you'd be able to take off the pit boy and shower and change and all of that jazz. And it would give you that in-depth data that the pet boy can give you. Um, mm. I, and also, I, I would argue that the reason you see, see the very, very high-tech uh, pet boy in Fallout 4 in Vault uh, 111 is because uh, that vault and the Tranquility Lane vault were among the last to be built. And they are arguably the highest tech because you have virtual reality and stasis and cryo. Cryostasis, yeah. Right. Those are those are some ridiculously high tech things, even within our world, much less what Fallout is doing without my uh, miniaturization of circuit boards. Right. So for those that for for Fallout 4 to have such a high tech um, Pit Boy simply makes sense to me. Um, yeah. And I, you could also argue that if they're able to get to the point where they're doing tranquility lane and cryostasis, that it's possible that for the, for the Pit Boy in particular that the sole survivor gets, it's of a high enough quality to not necessarily need to hook in directly because humans, humans do have a measurable electronic field around them. The heart runs on electricity. Muscles run on electricity. It, it's going in science fiction, but it could be reasonable to say that you have an external device that can read the electricity going through your ne- nervous system. Maybe not blood sugar, but you could definitely tell your blood pressure, your pulse, and your blood oxygen rate through a single... I mean, they test uh, blood oxygen and pulse on me at, at the doctor's with a little light thing that clips onto the end of your finger. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's both the high-tech option for the Fallout 4, but I don't think it unreasonable for, say, in Fallout 3, you're raised in the vault and are eventually gifted a pit boy It's entirely possible that part of the opening sequence that we just don't see is the surgical implantation of the port. And that's a big part of why the Brotherhood of Steel can't get into Operation Anchorage. They don't have the port. And they tried to get it off of Gary, and obviously that went went sour. So they had to have somebody who had Gary. analog technology to be able to connect to the VR system. Huh. I think that's also supported with 76. When you wake up and go and put on your Pip-Boy, it's not already on your arm when you first create a character right, in 76. Right. But have we seen any characters with a port on their arm? I the thing is, is most a lot of characters wear long sleeved items. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting if somebody I, was to find, you know, a character model even just in the data somewhere of a character with a port on their arm. Yeah, I mean that was that's me completely spitballing and theorizing from what I know of modern medical data. 
but it wouldn't surprise me that that would be at least an option that they thought about when creating the pit bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of good say, thoughts on all that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say because like all the vaults were built over a span of many years. So it makes sense that there's so many different versions of advanced stages of Pip Boy because of how separate the vaults were built from yeah, each other. Because each vault, upon completion, needs to be fully stocked. So they would have that set of Pip Boy. So when they build a new vault, if there's been a development, they may not be able to afford to refit all of the previous vaults, but they can outfit this vault. Right. Which all exactly the right. idea of, oh, why don't you sign up for this newer vault? It's got higher to technology you'll be able to do more right crystal brings up the point though of the courier in new vegas not having a port well we don't that's know that's obsidian it's a different game <laughs> <laughs> it's just a different game um, yeah i think all of this is 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 good speculation but it's also us trying to you know fit a, a square wedge through a round hole you know we're all just trying to say eh, yeah maybe this can we can make this work if this is what's happening here Aperture? Yeah, I've, that's the fun. That's the kind of yeah. fun speculation oh, yeah. that I love about sci-fi. Oh, is, true. Is that of course. Kind of, of course. Yeah. Uh, 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 it could also be that different vaults have different pit boys because, a, by population, vault one eleven, you need what twenty, twenty five pit boys, so you get a more advanced, better scientific pit boy. Whereas a vault like one uh, one hundred one. You've mm-hmm. got a population of a couple hundred people. You need a couple hundred pit boys plus backups. They're going to be a little bit on the cheaper end because right. you, you know, you need more. Yeah, or like 111, they were probably only given to staff, whereas yeah. in one of the other vaults, they're for all the dwellers. Um, exactly. Yeah, that would make sense. Well, this again, it's been a great topic and one that we could definitely go on for an entire episode. But um, we've got a lot of other people to get to, so why don't we move on? Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Good for moving on? Cool. Um, Nunamur? Does yours make sense to go to next? Yeah, yeah. Vic started, I started getting nervous because Vic started <laughs> flirting with, with the edge of where, and I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, because uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, VR technology. And as gamers all, and hope, chances are most people that are listening to this are as well obviously um vr is something that we you know hope would be what what science fiction often shows it to be a fully immersive thing where you can have sensory interactions with things but we are so far from that and and vr has come obviously so far as well Uh, what we can do with it now is amazing but it's nothing like the sci-fi concept of vr and uh fallout really really runs with that. And this is uh, similar to what Fire was saying with how there was limitations in what she could actually find as far as like the the origins and different things like that. The uh, the VR that's used in in the Fallout universe is also very similar. It's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly who made it, where it was made. All these different, different exact things are a little sketchy. Um, but as far as its basic appearances, um, we see it a, a few different times. Uh, we see it in Fallout 3 twice, uh, once in Tranquility Lane, uh, another time in Operation Anchorage. We see it in New Vegas, where the OK Boomers uh, use it at <laughs> Nellis Air Force Base uh, for training purposes. Uh, they're now the OK <laughs> Boomers. I appreciated that. <laughs> um, uh, so they use it for... So the Operation Anchorage was a training pod you know combat training tranquility lane is obviously that it has been i'm actually not really even talking about tranquility lane so i wasn't too nervous but um yeah, yeah. because I, I think that you covered that so well in your episode um on that so um and then again operation Anchor- anchorage is is a training and a training sim uh the boomers at nellis air force base uh use it for flight training uh where they're able to train without ever actually flying even old uh old planes so that that's why they're able to fly the bomber and everything. So they're already fully trained using. So the the technology that speaks a lot to what the technology is capable of. Because if I don't know how much people know about pilots and especially uh, jet pilots or fighter pilots, uh, but they have some of the fastest reaction time that humans are capable of. So if the fidelity of the virtual reality is to the point where you can train to fly a fighter jet, 
that's insane. This is beyond, this is like matrix level, you know, stuff that we're talking about. Uh, moving on, uh, a couple other times it shows up is also New Vegas at the brother uh, the uh, Brotherhood of Steel uh, Mojave chapter. Uh, they have them also for combat training purposes. Interesting thing I found on the wiki is that there is actually a cut reference uh, to the technology in the ending of Old World Blues, but that was cut. So wasn't able to see what that was going to be. Um, hmm. And then the one that I really want to talk about after a couple brief things about the other ones is the Memory Den. Uh, the Memory Den in Fallout 4. Uh, now, before talking about that one, the thing about the other ones, we know that the Tranquility, Tranquility Lane one is a Vision Tron, and it appears that all the other ones are that. That's what they're called, Vision Trons. It appears that at the Memory Den, it's essentially the same technology. It looks very similar. It's referred to as the Memory Lounger, similar to how the Tranquility Lane ones are called the Tranquility Loungers. And so it, it definitely appears to be based on the same technology. Now, the thing about this is, again, this kind of goes back to the... Um, Gameplay mechanic versus what we see versus what we actually experience. Everything we read about it implies that it is a fully immersive uh, experience. You're, there's some sort of you know plug-in in the back. Something happens. Again, something <laughs> connects to your nervous system right. because it does have that sensory feedback You know where you, you're going into the world, essentially. But all we see are screens that come down and go in front of your face, which is certainly not enough to give the impression of what we actually experience in the game, and certainly what's implied as to what is experienced in the game. So it may be that that's just a visual representation of what they're looking at, or would allow an outsider to maybe look in and see what what they're looking at and you know observe, or or an interface for you to affect the um, you know details of the simulation before you are actually immersed in it. You know, like, right, I, like I'm choosing this thing. I'm I'm going to go. These yeah. are my settings. Okay, go, and then yeah. you're immersed. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, like it's a pre check. It's a, it's a pre interface. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, but all that being said, you know the the we know from the past the usage of it is uh, that there it was used pre war for training purposes as well as consumer use, which is going to be stuff talked by Victor later. Um, but the thing about that is uh, there was essentially two modes, a lethal mode and a non-lethal mode. Uh, so there was actually live fire uh, modes that you could go into where you could die. If you got shot, if you got injured, you would die. And that's what we experience uh, definitely in Tranquility Lane, but that's a little different because Stanislaus is controlling, puppeteering most of it. Uh, but we definitely experience that with Operation Anchorage, where mm -hmm. you know it's a full combat experience. But as is the case with me, I usually come from some sort of emotional perspective. And so here we go again, uh, because the memory den, this is something that's amazing. This is way beyond just virtual reality. The ability to relive memories. That's just amazing w to be able to fully, fully immerse yourself into an old memory, whether it be spending time with a dead loved one or, um, you know, reliving the best day of your life or a great day of your life or, or reliving a bad day of your life because you need to process it and you need to see, you know, mm. what, what happened, what actually happened. Cause our perception, our memory rather is, uh, been well documented as being terribly inaccurate. Right, it's right. all bundled into our psychology and our perception and everything. So, do you so think we, that this technology, just to just kind of jump in here yeah, real quick, yeah. do you think that this technology gives you the actual portrayal of what actually happened, or do you think it it taps? Because if your memory of a thing is already corrupted by your attempting to remember it and retelling the stories and all those things, which is like like you said, scientifically documented, the more we retell a story, the more it changes over time, J even when we don't intend to. It just we just we re write our memory basically every time we recall it um do you think it's showing us somehow the actual past or it's showing us the representation that we are are holding in our brains in a more tactile kind of way 
that's a no i mean that's a you're right i could be going off in a completely wrong direction with that because it could just be that we're seeing our perception of it absolutely yeah. um i don't know that comes it, down, i don't this, know which well, it is. I mean, we don't know also exactly what is stored in our brain whether it's a mm-hmm. con whether subconsciously the actual memory is there and what we're able to recall is our perception of it that could also be so this this goes i i feel like i can't speak to that because i'm not a, a brain surgeon <laughs> or a neuroscientist you know whatever i i don't know because you know it comes into a lot of you know the the vr technology in fallout reminds me a lot of frankenstein where you have a foundational science fiction and horror story mostly science fiction uh and seemingly the important part of how the life was started how the the creature was brought to life is um skipped over right right <laughs> you know, just skip skip right. that part yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't want to did a thing it. and it worked yeah, and did then a thing is, yeah. and i don't want to even write it in the book because if i write it in the book people will copy it you know there's always some sort of rationale there you know so i think with the vr it's the same sort of thing you know it's like step one you get in the machine step two Step three, you receive your memories. <laughs> you know, it's one of those, you know. And so I don't, I, you know, I don't know. What we do know, though, about the memory lounger is that um, Irma had it. Um, we don't know where she got it or anything she won't say. Um, but it's actually Dr. Amari uh, that makes it possible. And it's due to her experience and her knowledge of neural physiology. So she's she's doing things that are you know again beyond our our current science she has an understanding of the brain that's beyond now how does that knowledge exist in the fallout universe now we're going to get into some dark stuff because you know the human experimentation that was being done pre-war the the neurological experiments that were being done the you know um vivisections and things like that that you know the unbridled, you know, un, you know, no question of ethics science that happened pre-war may have led to this, these sort of developments, you know, where, you know, the way to get there is very dark, but the yeah. technology that comes out of it is something good and ends don't quite justify the means there. But, you know, regardless, though, um, even if we are, let's say, let's go the least profound way and let's say we're just re-experiencing our perception of it. It could still be a great thing of comfort it could still be a great thing of even just fun mm-hmm. you know reliving a great day and it also could be again going dark again something that people could just completely lose themselves in and just live in their past and just sit in there all day and do nothing and uh but more than that one other thing about it uh is that it has the capability, as we see in Fallout 4 with when uh, Nick gets the implant from Kellogg, it has the ability to have two chairs con- conjoined. So you theoretically are able to experience somebody else's memories. Mm-hmm. That's like, is the selfish part of it is like, yeah, relive great memories, see dead loved ones, awesome. But the idea of being able to actually, we, we talk a lot on this show about putting yourself in people's shoes, empathy, sympathy, all these mm-hmm. things of, of understanding. Imagine literally being able to put yourself behind the eyes of somebody, whether it be someone you care about that wants to open up, wants to open their heart and wants you to understand them better or and vice versa, or right. whether it be a misunderstanding between two people that seems like there is no way this and you, you sit them down and have them literally t- live in the, each other's shoes you know so i mean the the emotional the diplomatic the um you know just just ways in which this sort of technology could help humanity it's like uh if that technology existed in any other universe except for Fallout, it would result in a utopia. But because it was Fallout, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's still it's still being used. You know, you come you come across Tranquility Lane where that tech's being used to torture people right, and keep them alive right. while they're being tortured. So I can imagine, you know, I can imagine that uh, tapping into somebody else's memories could also be a very uh, privacy breaking thing. You know, like are you able to do that with criminals in order to get to the 
source of what's actually happened in order to solve a case you know do they lose yeah, the right yeah. to, do they lose the right to their own memories in order to for us to save somebody's life you know like i think there's a lot of gray around how that actually works but in the right context it can be a very yeah. intimate thing but because it's very intimate it could be used for completely the opposite reason of invasiveness um, the mis the misanthrope in me says I do not wish this technology existed in real life because I do see that I see all the ways this could be used as yeah. you know mental violation if it's being done against my my optimal way of thinking about it is consensual of course you know it's sure. like a it's a it's a, another level of intimacy that would be available you know so, right. something else that people could do to connect um, other than the other options we have and. You know, so I do, I, I, I'm, you know, seeing all the beautiful parts of it, but realistically, and obviously in the Fallout universe, the dark implications of it, I think, would out, outweigh. And, you know, the commercialism of it, too, which I'm not going to step too much on, on Vic's part here, but like the idea of selling your past to you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the idea of commercializing this and saying, hey, we're going to sell you your good old days. We're going to sell you the golden years. Like what price do you put on that? You know, and considering yeah. the discussion already being talked about the price of, you know, the infl you know, putting aside inflation, just in or rather including inflation and talking about the cost of things in the fall pre-war fallout universe is insane. You know, so how much would something like that cost if you wanted to have a memory lounger in your home or wanted to have sure. a uh, VR sure. thing in your home? Yeah, and, and it is still fairly rare. Like, you only find these in certain locations, and generally they're government or vault tech or, um, you know, I, I don't know where the one from Memory Lane came from, but it seems like it was probably confiscated from somewhere and then integrated into their, you know, little community. Um, yeah, this this opens up a lot of interesting topics. Um, good, good topic. I have a feeling we'll be getting back to this a little bit when we get back to Victor. Uh, so... So why don't we hold off on the discussion about this till Victor's portion and move on to the next uh, the next topic, because I'm, I'm sure we're going to come back around. Um, let's move on to Courier, NV Courier. You, did you bring a topic for today? Anything you wanted to discuss? I mean, I, I get the experience now of uh, following Nunamur, so I mean that's, <laughs> that's, that's special. Uh, it's a rite of passage, so. bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, whatever you bring uh, is totally fine. It could just be like, "Hey, I think this thing's cool." What do you guys think? That's fine. Like, whatever you want to bring is is okay. Uh, I actually did a little bit of research on the uh, the Chinese stealth suit Mark II. That you can find in New Vegas, uh -huh. and mostly I just decided on that because I think it's funny. I mean, <laughs> there's a personal AI in this suit as you're sneaking around, and it makes commentary. And the whole time you're just trying to be sneaky, and it's just fucking your ear up the <laughs> whole time. Right. So, what'd you find out? So, uh, this this armor was created by the scientists in Big Mountain. And they <clears throat> they give you a series of tasks in order for you to, I guess, optimize the armor. So you can get a uh, dispenser, a medical dispenser, which will give you medics and stim packs when your health is low. And it will also boost your sneak from... I think it's an original plus five, and it goes all the way up to plus 15 for your sneak. Which, If you're sneaking in any Fallout game, no one's going to be able to see you at all. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so some of, the, uh, some of the quotes it has is, it'll ask you randomly, do you like me? Will you love me if I help you hide? And then it will also claim that it's time for combat when clearly there's no enemies around. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was I was uh, responding to fires. <laughs> Fire writes in chat. She writes, "Wait, your clothing doesn't roast you." And I wrote, "My pants do since all the food I ate last week." Uh, sorry, I was a little <laughs> distracted by my joke I was making. But uh, go on. <laughs> I mean, that's basically it. I just, 
dipping in i didn't want to go something too deep here so. yeah yeah so uh, the yeah armor's pretty cool yeah Ch- the chinese uh stealth suits the uh, the whole concept in this of like the americans went power armor so the chinese went stealth is really kind of interesting it's a it's a it's a chess play right it's a well if they're gonna go indestructible yeah. and blow everything up with these like personal tank outfits they wear then we'll just sneak around them you know like we can go the other way with this that was always my perception of that yeah exactly anyone have any thoughts about the, the actually this specific suit in general do you guys know this from the game yeah i uh i couldn't believe how much medics that thing kept giving me i'd like to stock up on it so i could sell it for caps and it just kept injecting me over and over and over again and then i finally got addicted and i was like <laughs> dude wait, what are you doing <laughs> And then it was, you know, the the weird comments about, do you like me? And I'm like, hey, I'm trying to try to focus. Try to like, focus here. Really don't need to. Don't. It's like when you're uh, when you got a companion in Fallout Four, and they keep wanting to talk about how how much you like them, and it's like, hey, you know, I don't know if you been paying attention, but we're in the middle of an op. Right. We're, we're trying to we're trying to kill some gunners today. Right. I need you to. We have super mutants hunting us right now. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're yeah. running. People are shooting at us. Uh huh. My big, oh, my big question about that armor is, um, why does the Chinese South stealth suit speak English? Maybe it's. I actually have a. I actually have a possible theory on this. Okay, go for um, it. Just, just in the fact of, in I know for a fact you find it in New Vegas, but I, I'm not sure if you find it in other parts uh, or in other games. But you do find. Chinese propaganda to the American public. Yeah. So theoretically, this Chinese stealth suit could be for double agent, sleeper agent, saboteur, who is based out of America, but is sympathetic to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It could be somebody or somebody who speaks both languages. Or somebody who speaks both languages. Yeah, a a double um, agent. Yeah. Right, so it, we don't don't necessarily know if it speaks Chinese, but for it to speak English actually does make quite a good, at least a, a decent amount of sense in terms of lore and the levels of espionage that the Chinese were trying to do, especially on the West Coast, which is close enough to Vegas. I found one of those suits in the Hoover Dam. Uh, some of the the NCR engineers, when they're going through the equipment, they found a couple two suits specifically. They didn't know what they were, and so they just threw them in one of the rooms and they got lost. But you can find it on one of the sub levels by uh, one of the generator rooms. Then, to me, that speaks even more that it is for a possible American uh, American citizen who is sympathetic to the Chinese and is willing to go full full saboteur. Because, I mean, you blow up the Hoover Dam, that's going to mess up a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is sort of kind of on topic to that, but sort of off topic. But that might, I don't know if that's like a reference to how the um, the plague, the new plague was released in the Fallout universe. Because if I'm not mistaken, Chinese agents stole that and got cornered on Hoover Dam where it was released. And that's how it was introduced to the public. So that might be like connected to that or something. I don't know. Like the stealth suits helped with that operation. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Really quick, just uh, surprising absolutely no one. I have a little bit of a crush on the Chinese stealth suit. On the just, suit itself? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, wait. yeah. <laughs> I, Fallout is the universe in which robots and AI are the most attractive <laughs> thing to me. I don't know why. I have a crush on all Assaultrons. Right. Uh, me, and, me and Ranger get I mean, in fights. The Assaultrons are pretty hot. The Assaultrons are pretty hot. He calls them Robo Karens, and I get very triggered by Oh, that. no. He does. No, they are not Karens yeah. at all. No, no. no. no Robo Brains might be Karens, but not, uh, not Assaultrons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a cool topic. Um, I'm glad you brought this up. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? Nope. Courier shaking his head. Oh, well, no. now I want to know why the uh, Chinese stealth armor in seventy six doesn't roast you. It's just that one. It's just that one type from uh, New Vegas. 
Oh, it seems unfair. I wonder if they'll. <laughs> I wonder if it'll be a special thing they add in at some point where they'll have like a special suit somewhere you come across, especially with the Brotherhood stuff coming, and then maybe some anti-Chinese <laughs> stuff coming. I mean, I'm sure they could add it in, or they'll put it on the shop and they'll sell it, and they'll be like, "This is the yeah, Chinese stealth suit is. that you remember from this other game." That's the yeah. true reason why there were so many people hating on '76 is they knew that the stealth suit didn't <laughs> roast you. <laughs> That's it. That's the one reason. That's the one reason. <laughs> Theoretically, the reason why the East Coast suit, essentially, um, doesn't act in the same way the West Coast suit does is, honestly, uh, you could say that it has to do with the fact that two different patrols went out. Um, I'm speaking specifically about, um, oh god, I can't remember the name of, name of the, the ship or the guy, but the submarine in Boston Harbor. Mm-hmm. He barely uh, yeah. realized that the that the apocalypse happened, and he wasn't given pre warning to the bombs dropping. He might have been uh, under a different command structure than the submarine patrols off of the west coast, and so they would be outfitted slightly differently because they would leave China at different times. Mm-hmm. That can make sense. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Wasn't the suit in New Vegas modified by the big MT people? Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I don't know. I think they added an AI to it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah that's that's probably why it is the way it is, because once you get there, I mean, they're kind of out of this world already. <laughs> it talks to you like uh, you're a lonely lab tech that you know hasn't talked to any other people <laughs> in quite a while, except the, the five yeah. robots or oh, the brains and jars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, Nunimer's dream job is what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know him yet. <laughs> cool. Well, let's let's move on. Um, Saber, do you want to go next? E. <laughs> hey. Uh, I, I'm talking about robotics, and I'll try to make it as quick as I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, the it's in saying how um how advanced their technology are compared to ours. Like just not I, a few years ago, I feel like we just got robots walking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, um, or what are they, what are they called? What's that company that does this? Um, where they beat Boston up the robots. Dynamics. Yeah. Boston dynamics where they kick the robots and then they don't fall over. And yeah, yes, yeah, totally. Congratulations on being able to walk by the way, Tom. Thank you. Robots. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so what I find advanced about it is that um, they we have hov- they have hovering robots that are basically just butlers um, for I guess more wealthier classes if we're talking about uh, economic wise they have them and they survive the nukes <laughs> two hundred mm-hmm. years on one robot that's got to be insane like I. Cogsworth, I'm surprised you're still there. <laughs> right, yeah, they, they, they last. They're, they're at least built to last. For sure. And uh, their AI, especially, is insane if we go into it. The fact that some can have specific personalities and uh, emotions, I, I would like to say. Yeah, and voice recognition. Like, we just now have, uh, you know, Alexa or whatever that's able to kind of understand what we're saying some of the time. But you can talk to <laughs> Codsworth just like he's your neighbor and be like, Codsworth, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, hello, sir. You know, and like, just where's have a conversation with him. Right, where's the, how's, how's the missus? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're so advanced that they started moving them to uh, war efforts and stuff. Like the Sentry Bot, the Assault Trons, uh, Mr. Gutsy version of Cogsworth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, those, we, we barely use technology in war. Well, I don't mean like barely. We don't have that type of, we have people going out on battlefields uh, and drones. Drones are a big thing. And I, I can't say that we don't use technology in warfare. Uh, but the fact that they can send out a giant robot that has big guns attached to it, uh, and then blows up on death. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Uh, and sometimes they can shoot nukes. (laughs) So 
the fact that we can make advanced technology like or they can make advanced technology. I shouldn't be. I, I'm, I'm a fan of the robots in Fallout 4. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, uh, it, it is a big divergence from, from our own world. Yes. You're right. The closest thing we have to something like that are, are still man-piloted, even if yes. at a distance. Um, I'm, you know, it is a little bit scary in the sense that, like, once you can send an army of robots off to do your wars for you, how much, you know, like, what's the moral quandary of just going to war? <laughs> you know, like, if it doesn't yeah. feel like you're going to lose people in doing yeah. that, um, it does create a dilemma. And we could also bring up my my favorite one, uh, Liberty Prime, which was brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm hmm the fact that they built well technically it wasn't working pre-war but like they got it working post-war and the fact that he can strategize where the enemy is located and stuff and i mean those lasers are pretty cool <laughs> yeah yeah do you think do you guys think that we will ever move to a point in our world where we're we're moving towards robotics in a similar way or at least in a way where we use them for warfare in a similar yes, way if, if not, not fully. if not the mr handy who flies around the house which is a little bit more extreme like that seems a little dangerous to have that guy running around in your house but when it comes to you know like automated tanks without humans in them so well, how is that any different than like drones or any of the stuff that we have now the unpiloted well, yeah. well they're, they're, question, these would be like ai run I as think opposed to options as they have it, they will use it for war. It. <laughs> I think giving them AI will be the worst part because if you give a machine the ability to think one life is better than the other, what's the that AI won't deem that its captor's life is better than the other? Yeah, well, so this, this goes into all the Asimov stuff of like you, know, you have to program the machines yeah. with you know three basic rules and all, all that kind of thing. Um, and this it's is there. Like there are hundreds one. of sci-fi stories about like what happens when AI becomes self-aware and all and all that. But um, do you think, yeah. do you, regardless of any of that, do you think we will move towards that? I think it's something like that. I, I, I think we may at least be able to develop the technology to do so. Um, not within my generation or the generation of my theoretical grandchildren, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, the, the, the march forward of technology will not stop. Um, however, whether or not the military decides that it is a good choice to be used is, a is no, not really a question of technology but a question of ethics and at that point you're looking at more of a situation that's less about do we do this uh, how do i word it? It, it at that point you would have the ai equivalent to the nuclear arms race right I, right for the, for the balance of power it across the world if it gets to the point where we're getting even just a even just ai controlled drones much less anything like an assault tron or protect tron sure it's going to be highly limited right off the bat by the international community I mean, nato un eu all of those all of those uh, organizations however people will still want them mm -hmm. because again that perceived balance of power the, the reason why so many countries actually outside of america and then the ussr which became russia got nukes was because well what's to stop the big ones from nuking us into orbit right and so right. that comes the arms race which you also have to try have to balance with ethics right so, okay, so purely technological standpoint it's gonna happen okay so i ethically, have a feeling most of us are probably on that same on the same route of like uh, yeah probably it just depends on who's in charge right and because of this topic, uh, the Department of Homeland Security is now watching the stream. So, hi, Agent Smith. <laughs> Hello, Agent Smith. Um, what do you think about, like, personal robots? What do you think about, like, in your home? I mean, we already have some of those, right? We've got we've got Alexa. We've got um, vacuum cleaners that you just say, like, this is my room. Go vacuum it. And it does the thing. What do you think my about this room? I attacked my old banjo yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, would I you invite into your house? Proper an AI that is uh, nearly indistinguishable from another human being to yes. be your personal 100%. servant. Yes. 
Yeah. I wouldn't, but they're already doing this with sex dolls. They're installing mm -hmm. conversational AI to real That's dolls. Wow. Terrifying. And awesome sure. at the same time. It's, it's already happening. I mean, it's just a matter of time before they're walking around and cleaning up the house, too. And then you'll have a branch of technology where you can have a robot butler and then you have somebody that a robot doesn't mistress? Really need to leave the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. You've got the butler so and then one you have the things. <laughs> oh, my God. One wait. of the things that I love about technology, like Google Homes and whatnot, I'm going to choose my words carefully because I don't want mine to activate. But, um... <laughs> I I suffer from autism, and I often am in states of a non-conscious mindset. Having a Google Home or having such assistive technology can really help organize for me. It can help me keep track of time and keep track of stuff. Yeah. So I find people. My mom was actually told, well, uh, kind of advised by a doctor to get me something like this. Huh. Uh, and it can definitely help kids with non-verbal autism or non-verbal issues with their, you can get locks for your doors now. So you simply say Alexa or stuff like that, sure. lock the doors and a child then can't go and open it or set huh. the alarm and an elder or a child doesn't have to go and set alarms and make sure everything is locked. So I find that automation like that could actually help a lot of people with issues both on the spectrum and off them. Yeah. And I find yeah. that it's a great tool for people like that. That makes sense. Um, let's bring I, this I was, back around to Sabre, because Sabre, you were hold, holding your hand up there for a little while. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things about those domestic robots is that, it, specifically I'm going to mention Sunset Sarsaparilla's factory plant, Mm -hmm. uh, they replace the workers with these machines. And, I mean, of course, technology can be used to help with hazardous jobs and stuff, but in the Fallout universe, they were being used to take away from, like, normal labor force and right. just use, like... Because then, like, I don't have to pay this robot. Right, but that's to... very real. Like, that's happening yeah, now. That's like, happening automation now. is a thing, and it's it's been happening for years. So and they really hit that home in '76. Yeah, that automation stuff because we saw the the remnants the of all the riots around town. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, the best sci-fi is an extrapolation of things that are already happening in our own world. Just run rampant. Right. Um, yeah. So this is a great topic. Let's um, we should again, another topic we could probably spend an entire show on. I think maybe for future episodes, what we should do is have one person present a topic and then all of us can respond more thoroughly. Maybe that'll be easier for us all to kind of kind of do. And we can take turns presenting. Um, just an idea now that we have so many people and so many good thoughts. I mean, it's, everybody has good things to share about these things. So um, it'd be nice to be able to dive in a little bit more with each one. Um, the, the, go ahead. the last thing I just wanted to say is for a humanoid with AI robots in the home, not just on the mental health side of things, but the physical health side of things. Um, we're already, there's already a, a good business in in-home care be it consistent to keep a quality of life well like my mother and father have two i've also been in the same home as somebody who is on hospice and received received nursing with palliative care for end of life scenarios and those kinds of workers while absolutely vital burn out fast yeah right Right. It's and a tough so job. even if you have a ro even if you have a robot who can just, you know, obviously that is not something you can completely eliminate. There will be need to be hands on nursing for so many things, but being able to cut down on possibly the routine stuff to be able to extend the viability of a trained human for the more important things to have a robot to be able to say kind of taking my mother's examples um help her around the house help her shower make sure she's got her medicines mm -hmm. an alarm set um tidy the kitchen Bas basic things that you don't really need a medical degree to do right um i think that in home uh medical care as a humanoid or even just codsworth sort of situation would be greatly helpful even in our universe yes sir you called me um yeah, good points. Very good points. Um, let's move on 
to Mothman, Mothman's Ranger, Mothman's, I'm sorry, Mandalorian. Did you have something you yeah, wanted to bring gotta, up this week? This is the way. <laughs> this um, is the way. But this kind this connects to Courier's topic. Um, but uh, the uh, my my subject I chose is power armor and just the, the giant like less focus on making the tank more efficient and just the power armor. It, just because like the only the thing that's like really fascinated me about the power armor is it's folk it's like it's still just as tanky as like a tank except like it focuses more on the more mobility than anything else like personal mobility and, as opposed to say yeah. like not like traveling at 60 miles an hour down the road mobility but like the individual being able to still move around in a, in an yeah. outfit that keeps them safe like that kind of thing yeah like a better positioning for some sort of heavy artillery kind of thing and um the it's i just found i just i've always found the technology of that to be really fascinating because it's 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 literally like it's an iron man suit with uh powered by nuclear technology with a throwback vibe to it Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's 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 really cool in the way of why it was developed in the first place just to over just purely to overwhelm groups of infantry like in a matter of minutes purely because of the extra mobility that the pilot would have and the protection given to it against normal anti-tank weapons because it's such a smaller target than an actual tank would be right right because it's still just this you know roughly the size of a person maybe a little bit bigger yeah yeah a big person with metal yeah and like it's and it's always been intriguing how it was like developed because like the first set of power armor the t-45 the most basic armor you can get in any of the fallout games was was wasn't actually first run on like a fusion core or like that kind of fusion element it was i believe it was like fusion like some sort of like fusion cell type device and it was super super inefficient when they first deployed it right and like uh i believe it was operation anchorage was when they first well, uh, it was the first deployment of an actual functioning power armor unit. Yeah, yeah. Um, way back, uh, Duke and I had a an episode where we dug into all that stuff. Um, but yeah. yeah, you're right. It's all very interesting. I have to wonder if something like that would work in the real world, in the same way that I would we just, imagine it in Fallout. I think there's still. It's the same thing with the Pip Boy and the way that it has the kind of gameplay mechanics that kind of have to get yeah. suspended of disbelief with. Right. Saber has a thought on this. Saber? Yes. Um, so recently I, I go to this thing called uh, Maker Fairs. Uh, they had to cancel it this year because you, you guess why. Um, mm-hmm. I got to see an actual uh, mech that they were designing for fights and stuff. They had to cancel this project because it was too expensive to pour in this money and stuff to uh, run these types of machines and make them. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was for like a robot fighting thing, but like you have to think, would it be really cost effective for the government to build? I mean, it's a mech, which is much larger than an exosuit, but it's similar in that sense of I'm in this suit, I'm controlling it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, cost effectiveness is definitely a thing. Um, do you think, from a perspective of like a, uh, a f- just general like battlefield effectiveness, that this would be something that could work in the real world? It would probably. If I was guessing, it would probably be more so on treads, like a tank or something, because of the weight, the sheer weight of the de- the device and the payload that it would have to carry like weapon wise for it to be any semi effective. And Mm -hmm. I think at that point people are going to be like, let's just build a tank. Yeah. Even if you're shooting mini nukes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What Um, do you think? Just a quick, uh, go ahead. uh, uh, Just, yeah, just a quick, like real world comparison. Um, The idea of the treads is super cool, Um, but there is, we already have a prototype power armor. Um, Boston Dynamics, I believe it is. Um, they have a frame that yeah, goes right. uh, goes around your legs, and it increases your carry weight. 
um, just like power armor. Right. Uh, it's not armored, obviously, and uh, theoretically, it could also be used for uh, handicapped people with lower mobility, giving right. them extra stability. But could you uh, put a bunch of a lot? But know? could you put a bunch of armor on it and equip it with weapons in a way that it would be beneficial on a battlefield? Yeah, my point is we're not that far from that. Right. I mean, if right. we're already increasing, That's what I'm wondering. if you can increase, right. yeah, if you can, can increase the carry weight that the legs can handle, then you can imagine how much weight if that technology develops, sure. the weight of the armor itself could be sustainable in the with a full body frame. It doesn't matter how heavy it is; it's the mechanical parts is what the movement's right. coming from. Right. So I just don't. I think it's weird how that one invention of the you know the the frame that increases you know your carry weight is a huge step towards actual real world yeah. and, power and armor technology I, I think it all comes down to like the iron man problem of like how do you power it though you know yeah. how do you how and do you keep also, that thing powered yeah it also goes into the one main advantage is that gives power armor such its combat effectiveness of it being able to carry the heavier unwieldy weapons that it just normal foot soldier would just struggle to use in an actual battlefield scenario. Right, right. Yeah. So, jokingly, when we were discussing this topic, I, I jokingly got upset at Mothman because I absolutely adore tanks. I do. I research military history just for fun, basically. And while it's amazing to think of possibly even carry weight maybe in a non-combat role, there are so many moving parts to power armor there are so many systems to fail so many delicate systems to fail which is even shown in operation anchorage you get put out by an emp blast which mm -hmm. you can get emp emitters yeah pretty yeah. It's, easy it's it's way it's way easier than getting a fusion core <laughs> to, to power exactly. your thing so, you can build an emp emitter out of a battery a piece of iron like a door hinge and a set of aluminum foil it's dead easy <laughs> yeah so while it's amazing to think about having these incredible one-man tanks so that you'd have more firepower on the field, even if you can't put a full loadout of a tank on one man, you can take a four-man group and get, say, twice the amount of loadout as you would get in a single tank. Um, four-man yeah. tank, four tank, uh, tanker groups is what's common in the U.S. Army, to my knowledge. The biggest reason, besides money, so imagine, like, Cold War era, money is no object. Mm-hmm. The reason the military will not take it is because it will not be reliable. On top of the movement, one of the things that makes tanks great are that they're heavy because they have so much they have so much armor, and that's what makes it awesome. Well, when you've got tank treads that are like the size of your bed, and you've got a whole bunch of weight on it, the overall pressure on the ground is pretty even, so that's why you have so much mobility. Mm -hmm. Now try walking through anything other than concrete. Where all of that weight, even if it's just a third of that weight, right, right, on you end up sinking feet. into the ground and the dirt and the no, yeah, whatever, yeah. Uh, those would be the two biggest reasons why as to not, in my opinion. However, it is a fascinating idea to think about. Yeah. So, Victor, what you're saying is the solution to power armor is clown shoes. Yes, clown shoes yes. Okay. or Pretty snow much. snowshoes. Lots snow really shoes. big snowshoes. To be fair, Saber did say that first, right? Or where was it? Or was it Ranger? Somebody else uh, said Saber. that. They mentioned treads. Somebody treads. already said that. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. point proper credit. Right. Right. Yeah, because, because, like, because for something that that's super, super heavy, it has to has the proper weight distribution in order to actually like be effective when if be it's mobile. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this Mothman before we move on? Oh, Saber's got a thing, and I think did uh, nighttime. Did you have something too? Um, can we let's go to nighttime because you haven't chimed in yet on this. Um, well, I was wanted to excuse me. Uh, one of the big leaps with the power armor technology was that T fifty one suit. One of the big yeah. things they talked about was the the polymer armor that significantly reduced the weight and the miniaturization of fusion technology. Um, I guess if you are fighting an enemy like the Chinese government, is that you're dealing with way too many foot soldiers. And if you need more squad level mobility, having a guy in a thick armor coating that can push through defenses and then allow covering fire, especially if it's a, a heavy assault trooper. I mean, if your guy's got a mini mini gun and he's foot mobile, is a lot harder target to hit than a full scale um, assault vehicle with like twelve guys in the back. 
I mean, that was what they were talking about. That was the big jump in the war that allowed them to retake Anchorage. And, you know, that is a good point if you are dealing with mud, that having a heavy suit of armor is going to stick right in the mud and you're going to you're gonna end up having guys getting suffocated. Um, but if frozen ground, I think that just happened to be the right place, the right time to hit that technology on the battlefield. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Really, really solid that ground. Is, I agree. And that mobility is nothing to be, uh, to be scoffed at. Um, for a historical reference, a good comparison could be uh, the first self, uh, self-moving, self-motorized artillery guns and anti-tank weapons that were in the late World War One, early World War Two era. It's not the exact same thing, obviously, but it's that same kind of love of technology of making heavy artillery that's usually very difficult to move, move easier than your enemy can move it. Mm. And that's what power armor would allow you to do. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I remember reading something in Fort Strong, because like Fort Strong was where they developed the T-51s, and to make it as effective as it was, its first deployment was overseas in China itself, and I remember reading a report on it, how it was a, I think it was like a squad of a few power armored soldiers that absolutely decimated a group of uh, a, a large, large group of Chinese foot soldiers purely because there were so many of them. But the power armor soldiers were so well equipped; none of the equipment that the Chinese foot soldiers had on them could penetrate the armor of the power on power armor. Right. So it was just an absolute massacre for the Chinese. Right. Yeah, Saber. Did you have something else you wanted to chime in with? I was just going to talk about just mention real quick how the armor would have to be thick enough for it to actually withstand like other things like tank or you you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like you can eat a missile full in the chest and not which even would, affect the soldier inside, which would be pretty difficult with uh, like, cause you have to think about you're going to have to carry this weight on this person's shoulders as well as their weapons, their gear and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know the math behind it, but I'm sure it would have to be substantial. Um, well, cool topic, Mothman. Thanks for bringing this one up. Uh, anything else to say on it or should we move on? Just that it's understandable that I brought this topic up. And since my 76 MAME is a power armor and ener- heavy energy gun wielding monster on the battlefield. <laughs> 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 nice. All right, let's move on to Vader. Vader 1723. What are you talking about? So, today? so my weapon of choice in Fallout New Vegas was the welding torch because oh. I actually went into the trade of welding. Um, and so I wanted to look up the difference between how they did welding in that universe to our universe. And unfortunately, other than there being a welding torch weapon, they don't go into the background. Hmm. But for a welding torch to work without electricity charging through it constantly, a.k.a. being plugged in, I would like to know how they got that to work. Do you think it might have been uh, some sort of like fusion power technology, like little tiny micro fusion cells? I could see it working. The only problem is there's no uh, ground charge to actually get a welding current going. Oh, okay. So I don't don't know much about welding. So in order to create a, a welding charge you need a ground so it's uh using electromagnets to heat metal to the point of fusion to where you can fuse two metals together just through electricity ah and so you're using electrodes to spark off of the metal to start the electricity charge so you need to have a positive and a negative going through the current just to get it going hmm and so to even start the spark you need ground and positive right uh, I guess if you were in like a power armor suit, you could use the suit itself as a ground. Yes. Because you're standing on the ground and you could run the charge through the suit. But if you weren't, then yeah, how do you ground it without shocking the person holding the, the welding torch, right? And, and that's the problem is I can't find any information about any construction at all in the Fallout universe. Interesting. Oh, this is a very, very niche topic. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this at all? Uh, Aperture. Well, looking at the design of the weapon itself, um, and what it's most effective against, that being uh, power armor and robots, um, I would imagine that uh, it it grounds itself against, uh, like, the end of the gun is sort of like a a C-shape, so I would imagine that uh, 
the top prong would be the positive and the bottom prong would be a ground or, or negative. And it would um, ground I'd, against the thing you were using it on? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like when you push it, you push it up against, say, the robot you're attacking and it grounds through the enemy in order to create the charge, which would also yeah. shock the enemy. Would that work, Vader? That would work for those enemies, yeah. Huh. That, that would totally work for those enemies. And I, I'm sure they've been modified slightly to be used, to be used as a weapon rather than just a, a trade tool. True. So That seems really diabolical in a sense that, like, if it doesn't, that if it hits something suck. that doesn't ground it, it doesn't do anything. But as soon as you hit something that has a ground, it just, and like you just start shocking and welding through whatever enemy you put that thing on. Regretting the metal armor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good counter to some of the other technology that we've actually been talking about, robots and and power armor. It seems like a a really appropriate... I mean, if you could get up close enough to one without dying to use it. Lainey, do you have something? Oh, she's just waving. She's just waving. I was saying hi to uh, Uriel Septim. Uriel Septim. (laughs) Joined us from all the way from Tamriel. Welcome, Uriel Septim. How's it going? Um, Well, that's cool. Anyone else have thoughts? Victor? So... Before my father was disabled, he worked on uh, the autopilot slash black boxes of airplanes. Wow. And he took me, uh, yeah, hence why coming down with Tourette's was heartbreaking for him, because he actually really liked this job. He got to solve problems with circuit boards, but you can't solder if you're shaking. Yeah. Um, However, when I was a child, um, he did take me into the office a couple of times, and... One of the things he wore all the time um, to make sure that he wasn't grounding off anything onto the onto the circuit board was um, it, it's a, a little it was a little elastic bracelet with a metal uh, disc that ran against his skin and then he could ground it out to a specific ground. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that would scale up to the kind of power you would need for a welding tool. But it's theoretical that it is simply just a piece of technology that is so small, like said bracelet, that perhaps this is me, sn- me moth, you know, kind of spitballing here. But ha- you, you have it on your wrist. Theoretically, the wire runs, I don't know, down your down your suit, especially if you're in a vault suit, and grounds out to like a metal pad under your shoe, something right. like that. Right. It could be that it was just that it's just so small that the the uh, the game doesn't need to tell you because it's one of those everybody does this kind of hand wavy and thing. Yeah. Um, I doubt it would scale up very well, but that would be a possible option from my knowledge of electricity and soldering. And soldering is just low powered welding in some ways. What do you think, Vader? Do you think that's potentially a thing? That is 100% potentially a thing. Uh, the only downside would be is if you got a slight nick in it, your metal would heat on your wrist, actually uh, melding the piece of metal Ooh, into your arm. Yeah, that would be Ouch. rough. Ouch. Ouch. Well, occupational I, hazard. The occupational yes. hazard. I, I almost wonder, we were talking before about automation. I almost wonder if um, part of the reason maybe Vader wasn't able to find more information about a lot of construction stuff and welding in the fallout universes because a lot of those things were automated it seems like um the technology of welding is something that could easily be put onto say like a a mr handy type you know and and be you know using one of its arms to have a welding torch um but i mean it definitely seems you know from the indications of fallout 76 that that was where a lot of the country was going so it would make sense if there was a lot of automation within construction which as the as the, also the son of a mm-hmm. not a welder but as a son of a construction worker that you know definitely makes me a little sad but you know that's the way of the future <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah as a son of an electrician definitely makes me sad um but uh, I was going to say, yeah, because in 76, and I think Fallout 4, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, we we do see uh, Protectrons outfitted with construction equipment mm-hmm. Tread, mm-hmm. on tr- sometimes on treads and yep. various other attachments for their arms. Yeah, yeah, the big yellow suits with the lights and stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, they also uh, do have the power to weld in that because they use, like it's said in one of the tooltip screens that they have electricity running through their gauntlets mm. that they can basically shock things with and it's used to weld metal so that's possibly 
where that kind of runs through. But then the implication of how would they leave off the excess electricity without frying their own circuits? That's where that yeah. kind of falls down to. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Lainey has to go, so we're gonna say goodbye to her. Bye, Lainey. She's gotta go. Bye, Bye. friends. I love all of you. Have a great rest of this episode. Um, yeah, I like I said, a bed fell on me earlier. My head is aching, and I still have to keep moving tomorrow. (laughs) So I'm gonna get out of here. She's gotta get some sleep. So yeah, have a good night, Lainey. Before you go, Lainey, I want to say, as a photographer, I appreciate your Polaroid shirt. Thank you. I also enjoy it. I, <laughs> I guess it's I'm a my film, shirt. I was a film student. It's not quite the same thing. You say this is your shirt? No, no, no. Huh? I also, I was oh. being you. I also enjoy it because it's my shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. my shirt. <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt I don't like right now. <laughs> yeah. Real recognize real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night, lady. Um, yeah, bye bye. Cool. So, any other thoughts on this, Peter? No, you guys actually answered a lot of the questions for me. So, yeah, I, it's uh, these are all things that I'm sure come up in having like go back and listen to the interview I, I got to have with Ferret um, with Ken and I had with Ferret last week. And there's a lot of this stuff they think through in the design of the games that don't always get documented or put in places that we can find it. So this might be things that they are thinking through and, you know, either leaving out on purpose or, you know, they're just not addressing because it's really not the main point of what they're doing. They're going, well, yeah, you could probably deal with this in this way and it would be fine. But then they just don't finish, you know, putting that in there because it's more, it's not the main focus of what they're doing. So you never know. You never know. Somebody like that might actually have answers to these kinds of things. All right. We're down to uh, Deadshot and then Victor. And I know there's some connection between your stuff. I don't know if you guys want to double team this one, how you want to handle this. Deadshot, what, do you, what are you talking about this week? Um, I'm talking about matter replication and specifically the way that it's you was used in commercial use for vault selling. Okay. So the way matter replication essentially works in our world is taking stuff like stem cells or atoms and trying to replicate them into a new synthetic form. So I know there's talk of it on the Mars project to try and make an atmosphere in Mars and then also stem cell research to get replicated organs. The mm-hmm. one I specifically was interested in is the one with Mars because it reminded me of the GEC program in Fallout. And there are three times we see GEX Fallout 2, Fallout 3, and Fallout 76. Um, I'm not too much aware of Follow 2. I'm sure Nunamur or Aperture could give me a lecture about it for days on end, knowing those two. But the one in 76 and the one in 3, I find especially interesting. Uh, specifically in 3, because there's a neat little thing that I found. If the player... So it's a part of a quest um, that a player has to... The player, the lone wanderer, has to do. And... There's a section of it where they have to follow a guy called Fox, and Fox essentially takes the Gek back. I can't exactly remember where I haven't played that much. But um, he takes it back. But if the player goes into the vault or goes ahead of Fox, the player can activate the Gek, hmm. and it will emit a like bluish orb sort of thing and instantly kill the player, <laughs> even if the player has God Mode activated it will instantly kill you. Um, And it's interesting because it's more of a thing of, because I know in 76, it's a part of the Vault 94 section, which I know is relatively new, so I won't talk much on it. Right. Um, But the kit is interesting because it's machine activated. So usually it was handed to certain vaults, and then they used it to replicate the world around them. So it came with atmospheric chemical stabilizers, water purifiers, cold fusion generators, which is, as opposed to like nuclear generators, they can actually last a lot longer and a lot more stable. Um, matter stabilizers, which would allow stuff like grass to grow, flowers to bloom, whatnot, seeds and soil. And what I find particularly interesting is not a lot of these were made. They were experimental technology. 
but they were still sold to consumer companies like vault And then the vaults were promised like, oh, you can build a whole community and <laughs> reshape the landscape. And I find the implication of the interesting because at least the way I look at it, that was a major selling point. It would be for people who were particularly interested in like, I don't know, nature or um, rebuilding the world in that format would kind of go, I want to be in that vault because they done that. Right. And I want to be a part of that. Do we have um, this spawns a, qu- a question in my mind? And I, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if you do either, but maybe you do. Do we know if Gex were sold to other consumers outside of vault tech or of, government agencies? Been. Yeah, not I, that I'm I fully either. aware of. I'm only aware of the ones with vault tech on my limited research. Yeah, with them. Aperture is shaking his head. No, no. They From- were developed. Specifically for the Society Prevention Program, and they're developed by Donis Brown, I think it is. Yeah, um, Stanislaus my handwriting Brown. Is- right, right. Um, and it, it's really weird how... So there are hundreds of vaults in Fallout that we know of, at least up to now. But only three decks have been discovered. So it comes to the implication of how many were made and how many were shipped out. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to of that off the top of my head. Um, Not only how many were made and how many were shipped out, but how many survivors of the vault know what they're looking at. Right. Yeah. If this is an uncommon thing, then would somebody even know what it is when they see it? I would. I would assume that if they, if it's a vault that had the the geck that they would have received some sort of documentation or training in regards to it. At least the overseer would have. Um, but uh, just a quick side note, as far as like their appearances, what's weird is that uh, that manual I'm always talking about from follow one, um, the Gek is actually talked about in there, mm-hmm. even though it doesn't, you know, majorly play in until fallout two. Um, but it existed, it must've existed in the fallout Bible, you know, early on. So it must've been like a very early concept that they came up as far as technology could have even been one of the first, kind of technology ideas that they came up with and even though you know it's only been factored into the story a few times yeah that makes i sense. mean it would make sense for them to factor it in super early if you take into account star trek 3 i believe it is where uh, they have the genesis project the 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 new the atomic bomb equivalent of a new eve at eden like basically Nature um, has been a science fiction concept for ever. <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me if it's like, okay, we're doing this sci-fi thing and they're going to be a post-apocalyptic. And they knew it was going to become post-apocalyptic, the society. Mm-hmm. It would surprise me if they hadn't started re- at least research on something equivalent to the Gek, Genesis, etc. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Any other thoughts on this, Deadshot? Um, oh, uh, uh, nighttime. Don't let Deadshot go first. I, no, I've not, and that was basically it. Okay. <laughs> Night, nighttime? <laughs> <laughs> um, the vaults that had the Gecko was, what, 90, Vault 94, and that was the one that had FEV, and then it was Vault 13, and is that... 13, is that, 13 uh, 87, and 94 were all the ones, I believe. 94 and 87. 87 was the... Was that the FEV vault in Fallout 3? Yes, and uh, 94 is the raid vault, I believe, in Fallout 76. Yeah, 94 is the vault, is the vault in 76. That's the one that's taken over by the gunners, right? Or is that the one that's still operating? Uh, vault 94 and 76. Oh, 76, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that would go into massive spoilers territory for a kind of subplot of 76, so I'm not even going to go into that. Yeah, Vault 8 okay. had two Gex. But nobody ever got to it. I wonder if the well, one, Gex were only just... One was traded uh, for the surplus water chips from Vault 13. This is Fallout yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it almost seems like the Gex were only given to vaults that maybe were handpicked by the Enclave. Especially the one in DC, if they were running experiments with FEV. 
wasn't Vault City created in part by a Gek? Like, didn't they send? It was that's right. Create Vault City. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Hmm. It's been years, so Noom would probably remember better than I. I was just playing like Fallout Two, and that's yeah. I just forgot about it. Everyone forgets about Fallout. There's, there's mm-hmm. also guys. These games are so deep. <laughs> like trying to remember everything is very difficult. <laughs> it's almost like someone should set up a podcast huh. to talk about yeah. the history and lore about Fallout. What would we call that, guys? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm thinking the Fallout History Cast, Fallout History Some... Show podcast. Better yet, who would good. pay money to be on this show? Yeah, I don't know why would anyone would want to yeah. do that. That seems silly. Yeah. Going. <laughs> uh, you should have charismatic host uh androids or something androids the, the charismatic yeah. host yeah how many episodes yeah. are we into this now this is episode oh, we're, we are currently doing episode 123 i've done 123 episodes of this i can't remember <laughs> crap and i've done so many different topics at this point um yeah uh, so yeah gex very cool concept uh very limited in the fall world though so yeah lots of questions on that as well uh definitely worth getting into in a future episode for sure um let's let's i think it's time to wrap it up with victor victor consumerism what are we talking about here capitalism in fallout uh basically the entire game Uh, no there (laughs) is quite a bit in in, um both how things were um advertised but also when when i first suggested this idea i was talking about there are tasks that are needed to be done in a society, and the way we complete those tasks are completely different from how Fallout does it. Um, before I remembered I have a secondary special interest in theme parks, I was thinking about, everybody knows about the porta diner and the perfectly preserved pie. Uh-huh. That is a claw machine of a very, well, I'm not going to say very old, I don't remember when the last one's closed, and I don't want anybody to feel bad. Um but of an older dining concept known as the automat. Mm-hmm. And you would have an actual kitchen, and it would be this huge bank of, like, little doors. And each one would have, say, like, a plate of biscuits and gravy, a slice of pie, a, a hot ham sandwich. And you would put in the proper amount of coinage, the door would open, you would get your hot, fresh meal, and eat it. Um... What you end up seeing today, of course, is now vending machines with shelf-stable goods. The move to creating such kinds of on-the-go snacks, shelf-stable foods, hadn't progressed to the same level that we're at in Fallout. So you see things like the Porta Diner, which is equivalent to, like I said, the Automat, but you also see... um, there's other there's other machines within the within the g- game that uh, that allow you to get things like uh, granola bars and things like that, but they aren't quite anywhere near as common. Mm. Um, but another place that's almost just like a perfect example of this is Nuka World, um, <laughs> which, while Old World Blues is my favorite for the lore, Nuka World is my favorite just because I really like the fact that it's basically a blatant ripoff of Disneyland. And I am living for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right. And it tackles a lot of things. Um, first of all, there are some things that have not changed. The mechanics of getting people to move very fast along metal rails, that technology kind of hits a ceiling eventually. Um, so while the physical rides aren't as, say, technologically different, a lot of the park is, wild, is wildly different. Um, Using the Disneyland model, uh, a lot of the people who would be called cast members at Disney, so I'm talking about people at vending, uh, people at stores, restaurants, janitors, people walking around as guides, all automated by robots. For better or worse. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) For the poor people (laughs) inside inside, um, Galactic Zone, with with all of those robots on high alert and killing anything that moves... Possibly for worse. Um, the the biggest difference that you end up seeing, though, is in the path of consumerism, there is that lack of ethics that we were talking about earlier in regards to human experimentation. Um, and that leads to a lot of different things within that. Uh, for example, when 
when reading the terminal, I believe it's the main terminal right before you go see the frozen head, well, frozen head of the guy who's the head of Nuka World. Um, you can read in his terminal and he sends like his, his secretary a note that saying, you know, uh, thank you for taking care of the t- care of the family of such and such subject. The gift basket was a nice touch. Because that person died while testing a soda. <laughs> right. Think about that for a moment. He died drinking a bottle of pop. Um, and so <laughs> you you end up seeing two kind of things when you look back at the consumerism of the pre-war era through the lens of Fallout. You see what they wanted to show you, which is that shiny, you know, hot car red chrome 50s Americana perfectionism practically. They leave it to Beaver. I, I it's sci-fi leave it to Beaver is what it looks like to me. Mm-hmm. But the realities of it leave so many in the ways in in the path. Um this path of consumerism and capitalism taking Uh oh. Did Victor freeze for everybody? Oh no! We were just getting to this. Oh, wait. I can't He's coming back. Never- He's God. back. Several- okay. Several words that I will not say on your stream. But anyway. <laughs> um, I apologize. My phone crashed. Oh, you're fine. We um, were like getting to this like point and then you just disappeared. And I was like, what? Yeah. It's, it's the Department of Homeland Security. They're just scared of what I'm going to say about capitalism. Yeah, I that's it. Know. That's it. Um, but when you see we see all of these advancements that have been made despite the lack of micro miniaturization in technology Mm -hmm. and it looks really good until you look at what the common person is going through you have a wage crisis going on not just within the the miners say in fallout 76 um i actually watched uh an entire playthrough of just the plot line of the miners and the auto miners Versus the the power suits and all of that stuff, and it, it's heartbreaking to know that such a you know long-standing labor-based economy broke. But also, like was mentioned earlier, Sunset Sarsaparilla, their their plant going under under atomized automation, mm-hmm. and that wage gap increasing. You do see signs of it. It's um it's hard to point out just simply because. Um, things like low-income housing aren't exactly built to be the sturdiest things in the world. Right. Um, but when you read the terminals, and then you read about stuff like, you know, like I said, stuff that isn't even really written down, you just see it, where jobs are being lost. And then you read about the food riot, and trying to have the majority of the population actually be able to get a full meal. It brings this idea of, yes, they got to a fairly comparable level of technology, at least when Fallout was originally conceived, late late 80s, early 90s. They got to a relatively similar state of technology before it all went down. But the means of which they got there is so wildly different, not just because of the lack of miniaturization, but... The Cold War era McCarthyism kind of stuff, allowing companies and government kind of to get away with a lot of stuff in the name of capitalism, you know, mm-hmm. showing we're better than the Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, haven't we all of that stuff? Haven't we still done a lot of that? I mean, we're getting into politics here, but haven't haven't we been suffering that same thing? in just oh yeah in, we've we've gone oh, yeah, kind of, sure. we've gone down a parallel path and but we're heading to the same goal ultimately it seems to right. me that we're kind of on that pathway the distance between the haves and the have nots continues to grow uh c- corporations affecting politics um the yeah. the okay. keep, keep public blind by giving the the shiny products so they don't worry about the fact that they're malnutrition because they can't afford to eat the right kind of food anymore. You know, like, all of that kind of thing. Yeah, bread and circuses, just minus the bread. Um, <laughs> just circuses. <laughs> quote Rome. Cir- circuses but, and crackers. <laughs> crackers and circuses. circuses. <laughs> crackers and circuses. 
Yeah, t- yeah, definitely. And I, with that statement, I'd say, you know, keep in mind, we're only in 2020. We still have 57 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you think in 57 years, we're going to end up where they are? Oh, man. It is. It is. I mean, it I, is the dark I, future. I, I don't know. It's either going to be. Is, it's either going to be pre-war fallout, or it's going to be cyberpunk. One or the other, right? Like those. One or the other. Those are I the mean, two it, options. It's sure not going to be Star Trek yet. <laughs> I yeah. don't want to alarm yeah. you guys, but Mad Max was set in 2021. I saying. know. I'm not yeah, but that's Australia. <laughs> that's that doesn't. That's not us. <laughs> we we all live in North America. That's different. No, we don't. <laughs> Okay. Lives in well, crap. He could move here. That's fine. You just assumed I'd his nationality. Stay where I am, just assumed I his nationality. Go where near your hellhole of America. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, well, whatever, How do you think you know? I feel? I have to go there every week. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these changes in technology, they're fascinating because it's problem solving. It's, okay, well, we want to show that they were able to do X, Y, and Z. But they don't have the micro circuit. And it's interesting to see the similarities and differences in the creativity as well, obviously, both of the theoretical people who are coming up with these technologies, personal robots, um, not just for in the home, but at theme parks, uh, the general atomic, like, I don't remember what they called it. It's like general atomic showcase. It's like a miniaturized city with like five businesses. And, like, one of the robots will kill you with, like, boiling hot coffee. Mm-hmm. And another one gets really mad at you if you, like, move the clothing at all in a different store. It's all Mr. Handy's. Oh, and one serves you, for, serves you uh, invites you to dinner. But you're I the dinner. to eat you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it, you know, that was supposed to be a showcase of how automation can better our lives. But there are also direct examples as to why... Automation is a dangerous and slippery slope sometimes. Um, I'm realizing I'm not as coherent as I meant to be, and I do apologize. Well, what, what's your, like, if you were to sum up everything, because you've covered a lot of different pieces of kind of this bigger thing, how would you sum it up? I would sum it up as what the, the biggest takeaway in regards to the technological differences between uh, the Fallout 2077 and our current timeline and, you know, us having the microminiaturization is I wish that there was more that had survived that was not the idea of America that was trying to be projected. The mm, high-tech right. Right. ideas and ideals of America, which are ubiquitous in Fallout, because mm-hmm. that's all you see we're in no way the norm for the vast majority of Americans. Right, right. There's this underlying majority kind of experience that we are not getting a full picture of. We get terminal entries, but shanty towns don't last under a nuclear blast. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting perspective on that. Um, I think, but I, I think the fact that we aren't getting the full picture makes it more interesting when we do get hints of the full picture, right? It does. It so, allows you to speculate and spitball for three hours if you really want right, to. Right, That's exactly. To do About all sorts of different stuff. Well, let's open this up. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this? I think the term shant- shanty towns don't last in a nuclear blast is probably the saddest thing <laughs> anyone's ever said on this entire program ever. Yeah, and we've said some sad shit on the show. It sounds like the we subtitle of a book. Like, <laughs> we like Victor, writes, that Victor writes an autobiography. It's going to be like the story of Victor. <laughs> shanty towns don't last in a nuclear blast. That's like. <laughs> <laughs> Victor writes a book, it's going to be 500 pages of rambling and then suddenly uh, 10 pages of the actual content. <laughs> <laughs> tangents upon tangents upon tangents. At one, point, just... at one point in the middle of the book, it's just going to say, oh, it's late, I need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe it's just ranting and, and like tangents until the very last page where you say, and all of that was to simply say... <laughs> Chance yeah. towns don't last in a nuclear blast. And that's <laughs> that's it. That's this. That's this. All of it, right there. Well, I've seen a nuclear. Uh, what is it? Nuclear PSA that got repurposed by the uh, the paint house industry, where they said the the third house on the left. Make sure your house is freshly painted. Your clutter is taken care of in the yard because if there is an atomic blast it will ignite on fire and only painting your house and proper maintenance can prevent this. Wow. That's great. 
What era did that come out of? Because the thing 1955. Is, like, okay, yeah. then that's going to be a white house with white lead paint. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Lead can absorb a lot more energy than polymer. That's amazing. I mean, uh, actually, less they do use lead <laughs> to shield nuclear reactors. Yeah, yeah, I mean, lead has its uses, but not near humans <laughs> who might touch it. Just don't eat it. It's <laughs> fine if you don't eat it. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Well, guys, this has been awesome. Thank you for joining me. Um, everybody knows that you can reach all of us on the discord because we're all on there all the time chatting it up um would any of you like to leave alternate ways for you to get a hold of go ahead and raise your hand we'll just kind of go down down the list I'll, some of you guys i can't see your hands but um let's just go alphabetically Ap aperture how can people get a hold of you yes uh if you want more aperture flash in your life and let's be honest who doesn't want that <laughs> you can find me at uh Fire instagram raise your hand <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, Instagram. I see how it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you can find me at Instagram, uh, Snapchat, but I, I'm off and on with Snapchat. Twitter, I'm trying to build my Twitter. And uh, every now and then I'll stream on Twitch, and you can find me on all those platforms at Aperture underscore Flash. If you really, really want to make sure that the message gets me, though, you got to write it down on a piece of parchment. You got to march out into the middle of the desert, get yourself a magnifying glass, burn that parchment with the magnifying glass. The smoke will send up a signal and you'll hear me coming. <laughs> kind of like summoning a <laughs> demon or something. Um, fire. Got to summon a connect somehow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also shout out to you, you and uh, Matt. Thanks for reaching out guys. Cool. Cool. Fire. I'm all over the place at Firewriter, so you can find me at Twitter and Instagram and on PS4 and on PC and <laughs> on Twitch. And uh, I also have a podcast now uh, called Pixel People, and you can find that at uh, on Twitter at Pixel People Pod or on Anchor or whatever you choose to listen on. Yeah, and you've been talking about NPCs and video games, so if you like the kinds yes. of stuff we talk about on these shows, you'll probably enjoy her show too. Yeah, go check it out. Pixel people. All right. Uh, Nunamer. Uh, yeah, I'd like to also plug uh, Pixel people because uh, I had the opportunity to be on uh, recently. I was on the episode that aired today talking about my Tide for Fallout 3 favorite game of all time, Final Fantasy VI and Celis. So check that out if you want to listen to me get emotional again. Um, also, I last time I checked in and said, oh, I want to get back into streaming. Uh, yeah, that happened. So I've been definitely doing that. I got Yay! heavily involved with the Fallout for Hope uh, uh, part, and I did a 17-hour stream of Fallout 76. So I think I've proven myself. I could do this. I could do this. Uh, I just got, I lost internet recently, got it back. So I'm going to get be getting back into that this week. So uh, check me out on um, Twitch at Noonimer and also on, on Twitter as well. Nice. Nice. Who else wants to chime in? Anybody? Anyone else? All right, go for it, Saber. I am Saber1431 on Twitch, and I've recently started hopping back on uh, streaming. Uh, I'm doing uh, currently a playthrough of Stories, uh, Passive Destinies, um, and some other games like Fallout 76. And I'm also on Twitter at Saber1431. Not at, because I... Uh, Apparently that tag was taken. <laughs> oh, that happens. Cool. And then uh, nighttime, nighttime Smith. Uh, just follow me on Discord. Um, my Twitter account's nothing special at this point. Uh, but if you want to <laughs> play Fallout seventy six, uh, just hit me up on Discord and we'll figure something out. Yeah. What platform are you on? I'm on PC. PC. Awesome. One of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. Anybody else want to chime in? <laughs> I forgot to mention something. Yeah, what? You can find me in Appalachia now. Oh yeah, yeah, you're playing 76. That's true. Yeah, I'm on I'm on PS4, y'all. So nice. uh, same same username. Yeah, go go look up Aperture Flash on PS4. There. Cool. And I think that's it, unless somebody interrupts me and it's like, I want to say where things reach me too. But otherwise we are all on on the Discord, on the Robots Radio Discord. Look up Robots Radio Discord, just Google it, you'll find it. Uh you'll be able to get in because there's a uh link on the 
robotsradio.net page. And you guys know how to get a hold of me and all my stuff. Uh, listen at the end of the show for those details. And thank you again to especially these patrons, but all of our patrons. You guys are amazing. We are wrapping up. This is the last episode of the second year of doing the show. And you guys are doing the robot and dancing. And that is amazing. So if you are not watching the live version of the show, you are missing out. So you should come join us on twitch.tv slash robots radio or check out the, the videos on the robots radio YouTube because the, these guys are hilarious. Um, also, another thing that happens during the shows is Aperture Flash likes to mime everything else other people are talking about, which is also entertaining. See, he's doing it right now. And um, I'm going to hold up hold, before we do this whole thing. I'm pulling up the Patreon. I want to I wanna just say thank you to everybody because you guys, you guys are what helped me do this and keep doing it. We've got a whole nother year of content coming. Um, Lainey and I have been thinking about ways that we can continue to expand on the content and do things a little bit differently. So we'll have some info about that probably on the next episode, but here, let me pull it up right here. Uh, relationship manager. There are currently, holy crap. I have to go to the second page. 51, 51 of you guys, 51 of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you are a new patron from this last month, then I will be calling you out uh, most likely on the next episode because uh, this episode takes so long, but you'll be getting your call out for signing up on the Patreon and anybody else who'd like to join us, please join us for next month. We'll be chatting about all sorts of things in the future. And I think that's about it. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you chat for being here. Thank you patrons. You guys are amazing. Everybody have a wonderful night and we'll see you next year. Bye bye. Y'all come back now. To plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.